And my dad was like, you can always take out 10 men with two weapons, a can of gas and a bat. So then, yeah, I'm smashing big chunks in, you know, an eighth in a night easily, you know, and sometimes more. I, I wasn't a nice person. Whatever I could do to feed that crack habit, it was bad. I'd taken friends hostage at knife point, but, you know, good, good mates. And obviously that, that, that does something to a relationship that can never be fully restored. So I, I am an ex-addict. I'm an ex-cocaine addict. I'm an ex-porn addict. I'm an ex-crack addict. They started looking at my emails. They could see that I'd been watching porn sites while I was preparing sermons in the church office. And, and as it zoomed in, I realised they're not coffee beans. They were the faces of dead African children. When I mean, people say to me, are you religious? I'm like, no, I hate religion. I think religion's one of the biggest killers and war, you know, war starters there is. But I'm an unashamed Christian. You know, I do believe Jesus saved my soul from hell. I believe that. Quick one. I want to thank our main sponsors, Bow Security. They're a UK-based security firm that cover the entertainment, industrial, corporate, and construction industries. I'm going to leave the links to their Instagram and their website below in the description so you can contact them direct. You can also find my own social media platforms down there too. And if you've got this far and you haven't yet liked and subscribed to the channel, can I ask that you do so? It takes two seconds costs nothing and it helps us improve the experience for the guests and for those at home watching. Thanks again. Your support is greatly appreciated and I hope you enjoy this one. Rob, good to meet you, mate. Thank you for coming on. No worries. Thanks for yeah, having me. I appreciate you coming. I mean, I know you've come a long, long way. Yeah. I know that you live in Malawi. That's right. And just to give people listening a little bit of context before we start mm -hmm. with your entire life story, because it's, yeah. a, it's a fascinating one. You've been to jail for extreme violence. Yeah. You've had pretty much every addiction under the sun going. Yeah. Uh, you're a born again Christian. I am now, yeah. An evangelist. Yeah. You live a very different life now. Yeah. You're out in Malawi. That's right. Fighting against child marriage. That's it. Uh, but the journey to get to where you was to where you are now mm. has been uh, a long road. It's been a long, turbulent road. Indeed. You're from a, a council estate in Hertfordshire. Yeah, it's called the Jackmans, but it's nicknamed the Crackmans mm -hmm. um, because obviously the drugs and all that that go on there. And so it's, it's not inner city London. It's not like inner city Liverpool. Um, back in the day, I thought, and we all thought we were gangsters, you know. So what I say now when I do talks in prisons or schools, or whatever, to try and belittle that life a little bit, not to, not to embarrass people, not to mug people off. But because I don't want my son growing up thinking that that lifestyle's good or healthy in any kind of a way or other people that might be listening, I do try and mock it a little bit. But, you know, I go into prisons and I say to the guys there, they're massive, big lumps, you know, training. Um, and I say to them, you, you're just like I was. If you want to be gangster, but really you're a scared little boy. And when we're scared little boys, we either sort of internalise stuff like most people do or like me, try and just get noticed. So I did everything I could to be noticed because I thought that will make my dad proud, you know. For me, it always roots back generally to a father-heart issue, um, how we were raised or, you know, the relationship we had with our dads, I think is a massive, massive part of why a lot of people turn to drink, drugs, violence, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I grew up in this estate called the Jatmans and it was quite, it was, it was a London overflow area. So during the Second World War, people would sort of just get out of inner-city London so most people there were from London originally. You know, my, all my dad's mates, all of my mates' dads um, are ex-Cockneys, you know, they've moved out of London. So I was raised on this estate and everything pointed towards drink, drugs, violence, sexual, you know, immorality, all those kind of things. And I just got so absorbed in it because everyone around me was in it, you know, and you become part of the culture around you, don't you? Yeah. So was your, was your dad into violence and drugs. So my my dad, um, I mean, to give you a bit of a background on him, at his funeral they played Only Fools and Horses theme tune because he was a proper Dell boy. Um, on his headstone, at the on, you know, when he died, we put a lovable rogue. Everybody loved him. You know, he, he had his, a roofing company that I, I went straight from school, even weekends, summer holidays, you know, when I was a kid. I was so young working on the roofs with my dad that if the police went by, I had to lay down on the scaffolding because I was, I was up there illegally. And he'd say, lie down. Um, you know, but I wanted a graft. He, he was a real working man. He, you know, he was a hard worker. He's an ex-alcoholic. So I heard, I heard all the stories growing up from his drinking buddies that were still alcoholics by the time I reached 16, 17 and going in the pubs. He'd never drunk in front of me. 
And all these guys would come up to me and say, oh, you're Lionel Joy's son. And I started to realise that that got me a lot of attention, being Lionel Joy's son. People would, you know, give me a lot of respect. People, Some people would give me a lot of fear. So I didn't really know everything that he was into, but I just knew that he was a local rogue. And, you know, uh, he gave up. Apparently when I was nine months old, he went to my mum and his best friend, who was his drinking buddy, paralytic drunk and said, I've just had a baby boy and he'll never see me drunk. And I never did. He just knocked it on the head. Nine months into, you know, I was born nine months. He was smashed. He said, that's it. He's not going to keep seeing me drunk. And he never touched another drop. And he'd go in the pubs all the time and drink grapefruit and lemonade. He'd buy everybody a beer. All the police that he had, some of them he had in his pocket, you know, and they, they were sort of, he was mates with some high up CID who really shit on me later on, you know, because he thought they were going to do me a favour with a crime that I committed, a violent crime, and they didn't. They just, they took advantage of him a bit. We'll get into that later. And um, so he, what he would do is he would let them go out. He, he would drive off, sorry, leave the pub stone cold sober because he'd been on Grapefruit Lemonade all day. And uh, he would drive off wiggling the car all over the place as if he was smashed because the police used to wait around the corner trying to, the internal affairs, I think, for these CID officers and all of that. They were trying to catch them out as like drinking on duty, blah, blah, blah. So he would act as if he was drunk. So they'd pull him over. And as they pulled him over, the other guys that were drunk would go the other way in their cars and get through the barrier or get through the police, you know? <laughs> so I grew up just seeing that and hearing those stories from a very, very young age, coming home from school and seeing guns on the table or, you know, weapons, see it, cans of gas and all that. And my dad would test them out. He would go in the shed and squirt it in the shed and then put his face in there and say, yeah, it's a strong one, lads. You know, and I, I was a young kid seeing all of this, going to loot him when he was doing whatever deal he was doing and, Sometimes he'd make me wait in the car. Sometimes he'd let me come in. And there'd be a box of watches on the table. And I didn't know what, what's a Rolex. What's a, you know, I didn't have a clue. Some of them were probably f real. Some of them, most of them were fake. So he was right into all the, co all the fake perfumes. This was the days when we used to do the mock auctions, uh, Petticoat Lane. So I'd grow, growing up, I was at Petticoat Lane every Saturday, earning more money than I could have dreamed of at that age, working with all these guys that were, you know, rough old boys. Um, Ripping people off, you know, they were giving them empty boxes. They had security on the on the shop, you know, so if anyone came back and, and complained, they just got escorted out the door. So I just grew up with that. That, for me, was all I knew. It's all I'd ever been a part of. And I noticed that if the more I got involved in that, the more I'd sort of get a bit of recognition off my dad. And that was what I was desperate for. I wanted him to be proud of me. You say your dad was a rogue, but yeah. if, he, if he's dealing... Firearms. Yeah. And, well, I don't think he was. It was he would associate with the people that was. I think he was. He was smart enough to sort of be on the on the fringes. But he was happy to have the guns in his house. Yeah, yeah. Or, or if they turned up at the door and they'd been on the Charlie all night, I won't mention some of these guys' names because some of them are still active in that world. Um, but if they, you know, I remember sitting there one Saturday morning with my dad and you know, the match of the day or whatever was on a cut minute, and all of a sudden he's looking out the patio window. And he's like, "Is that?" I won't say the name. Um, and one of them had been at it. He was a local nutbag, you know, and he was the one I aspired to be. Like, he was the local gangster. Saturday morning, all of a sudden, he's climbed over the fir trees we've got at the back of the garden, come through the allotment from behind the garden. He's obviously been up all night, at it all night. And so he'd sort of come in and put a gun or something on the table. So, and then my dad would be like, I think my dad was a little bit intimidated of him, you know. So he, he didn't want to just say to him, get out of my house, my son's here, whereas I would have done. Mm. So that was me now. You know, you don't bring that into my home with my, my little boy in bed or whatever. Um, so I'd see that it wasn't so much that he was dabbling and dealing in them. It was just that he was around them figures. And I think he kind of liked it cause he got the, he got the respect to them, but he, he, that's why we said he was a lovable rogue cause he wasn't as bad as them. He was just on the fringes, but it was enough for me to see that life too young and get drawn into it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to ascertain. Yeah. Where, where where between gangster and rogue yeah, yeah. was your dad? Definitely more rogue. More yeah. rogue. I mean, he was known for a bit of violence and stuff. And he did a stint in jail, um, but I don't think it was for anything. I think it was like, so, you know, some theft or whatever. He would deal in like um, s antiques and all of that, that sort of stuff. Um, I, I'm pretty confident that he got fairly involved in the Masons, like looking back hmm. at some things I've seen now and heard and whatnot. But again, he never mentioned anything like that. So he, his roofing company did really well because he was in with the local councilman, and the, you know, those sort of things. And it was all sort of, that's why I think the Masons were involved because it was all look after each other. So councillors, politicians, high up police. So he was kind of, he knew the gangsters and he knew the cops. He knew that, you know, he was, he was just in the middle, I think, just 
making his pennies. It's like the ultimate networker, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's what he was. Mm. Yeah, and he yeah. would put people together. He was he was good at that. You know, he was a good delegator, but um, good businessman. Started off when he gave up the booze. He, my mum tells me he used to walk from one town to the next with a ladder and a bucket of water, and he'd he'd do window cleaning. Then he started cleaning out gutters. Then he started replacing tiles on a roof. Then he set up a roofing company. So by the time I left school, I went into a fairly decent sized company that was doing well. I had work coming out my ears. But working for my dad, I think, was probably the worst thing that ever happened for me and him because he was always highly stressed. I mean, he was on like 25, 30 tablets a day um, for anxiety, stress, heart attacks. He had three or four major heart attacks. He died of a, of a heart attack. Emphysemia, through smoking for years, the alcohol days, all of that. Um, so I was always terrified my dad's going to die. Any sort of sign of stress in him, especially if we were rowing, because he'd go from zero to 100, um, you know, I would I would be panicking. I'd be and I'd then try and retract everything I'd said because I didn't want to be the one that killed me dad. Mm. And eventually, he did die. We had a massive row this day after a job. He had a heart attack and died. And I blamed myself for years. You know, I, I was convinced it was my fault that my dad died. So your last words to your dad weren't very nice ones. His last words to me before he died was, "You're a stupid cunt." Mm. That was the last thing he ever said to me. Do you remember your last words to him? I'll kill you. Because I, my dad was the only person, I mean, I wasn't the hardest out there by far. I've got mates that are still involved in that life. Um, most of them have grown up. Most of them have got kids now and I follow them on socials and I'm like, do you know what? He's built a good business. He's done well. And I know things about them. They know things about me. There's a few of them that still want to be a gangster. And I do say want to be gangsters because I, I know and I've heard and I've read the books. I've been in jail a few times. I've seen real gangsters and I'm like, we weren't real gangsters. Mm. We, we were thugs. We were fight. We, we we loved to tear up. But if we left our hometown and went somewhere like Liverpool or London or Manchester or something, we'd have probably got turned right over by some some real some real gangsters. But we we read all the books when I went to prison. I read all the books, Dave Courtney's books, the Craze books, and, and and watched all the movies. And it's like you know, it's half the conversations we'd have were just words that we'd picked out of a book or a movie that someone else had said. So I always say we were just plastic, you know. And I, I don't mind admitting that. I've got you know, I'm not I'm not ashamed to say that I was a wannabe. Before I, because I want to find out about your mum, just to get the balance between your mum and your yeah, dad yeah. to work out sort of what's moulded mm. you. But just going back to the last words or the last exchange between yeah. you and your dad, because that's yeah. that's a rare thing mm. to happen. Yeah, That's real bad luck. So yeah. how did that affect you? Yeah. So going back a little bit to give a bit more of a foundation, um, me, my dad, ne he was of that generation. He never said, I love you. In fact, I think he said to me, I love you three times. And that was when I'd, he'd had three major heart attacks and I'd go to Lister Hospital, uh, Stevenage. He'd be all wired up and tubed up and he thought he was going to die. And I could see the fear in his eyes. Um, and he would say things like, I do love you, son. Don't let your effing mum have my effing money because it will go to the effing church. Um, and, you know, go on and make me, you know, he, uh, there was those conversations, but they were very rare and they weren't, they weren't sort of everyday life. I've got pictures actually recently of me sitting on his lap and I always, I never remember him ever sitting on his lap. So my cousin gave him and he goes, I need you to see these because you always talk about your dad never sat in his lap and look. And there was one or two where I was, but they were very, very rare moments. He didn't affirm me. He didn't say, I'm proud of you. I remember my first jail sentence, my mum literally made him sit down at the table with a pen and paper and write me a letter because he wouldn't visit me because the visits were an hour long and he couldn't go an hour without a fag. So he came once, 20 minutes, 30 minutes into the visit. He's he's like, you know, he's itching and scratching for a, for a fag. Um, and he says, oh, I'm sorry, 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 I've got to go and have a fag. And that just made me feel so rejected. You know, I was like, you can't even sit an hour with your son. So my mum made him sit down and write me a letter. And, he, and it goes like this. I just want to tell you that I am proud of you. I was proud of you today, um, the way you stood in the dock and took your sentence like a man. That was what he was proud of. Mm. He wasn't proud of, you know, like work ethic or some <laughs> morals or, or, or something like that. It was, it was because my mates were shouting and screaming about their sentences and kicking off because they were scared of getting doing a two stretch. Uh, and I was expecting five minimum and I got 18 months on the first one. And I, so I'm over the moon. So I walk out smiling, happy, thumbs up to the judge and all that. I was, I was happy as Larry. And so that made him proud. And I remember, I remember framing it. And after he died, I put it on the wall. And so... Going back to what you, what you were saying, working for him became just, it just heightened the stress between us. It heightened every crack in our relationship massively. 
Um, especially when I was drinking a lot and then I was going on the coke for a little while. We didn't know I was sniffing coke, but it was his mates, this this gangster guy that I was telling you about earlier that put the first line at me. I was waiting for a sentence. Um, I was on I was on bail. I had more. I was the only person. I don't know if it's changed now, but at the time, I was the only person that was banned from the whole of the UK. Every I, I wasn't allowed in any on license or off license premises in the whole of the UK, which included Northern Ireland. That was my bail condition. I was banned. I didn't have an ASBO where I weren't allowed on that street. I was banned from Hertfordshire. I had to move out of Hertfordshire to Bedfordshire. The, 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 the conditions that they gave me, because the reputation, although I didn't ever do a massive stretch, we, they, they, they wanted us, you know, because in that area we were feared and we were causing a lot of havoc, selling drugs, beating people up every weekend. It was just the norm. They had a website, the, the Hertfordshire police had a website, which I, a friend of mine who's a, it was a boxer and he was also in the police, he gave me one day, so I got the pictures of the mug shots and all that, which we can maybe link somehow. And you can see the difference in me, the, the transformation just visually. You see in my eyes, this is a lost, the first time I went to prison and the first mug shot, you can see I'm a young kid. I was like 16 or something, you know, it was just swearing at the police when they tried to pull us over after a night out and I'm effing and blinding at the coppers get nicked, you know, in and out in a couple of hours. And you can you can see the progression in these eight mug shots. So then in 2002, I think it was, when I, I got caught in Bulldog with a, with a gun. So the gun had been doctored so that it couldn't actually fire. So I was carrying that around, but it was for fear. But I, I wanted to terrify people. I, I got off on people being scared of me because I wasn't the tallest guy in the group. I wasn't the biggest guy in the group, especially when I was on the coke and the crack. So I'd wear puffer coats and all sorts to try and make myself look a little bit bigger. And really, it was just all a cry for help and like, you know, just trying to be noticed. So I'd carry this gun just to scare people. But I did pull it out on this lad in Bulldog and end up doing a two stretch for it. But I was expecting a lot more. So all these bail conditions were unheard of back then. It was like for someone that was wanted that badly, you got you got remanded. But again, I think my mum, my mum was praying all the time and she was the extreme opposite of my dad. When I when I when I was five, my mum became a Christian. So prior to that, she said if she wanted new furniture for the house, she had to play my dad at poker because he was a terrible poker player because he was always smashed. So she wanted something from M MFI where, you know, back then MFI, get the wardrobes mm. and all that. She'd say, all right, if you won't give me the money for wardrobe, I'll play you at poker. And she'd win and, and get the money from him and go and kick the house out a little bit. Um, so she was a drinker, smoker, swearing all the time, shoplifting. All my mates back then, the kid, when they were kids, their mums and dads were buying you know, stolen clothes off my mum. She'd put me in the pushchair, wheel, wheel me around Sainsbury's or wherever it was, Marks and Spencer's or something, and put stuff underneath me in the pushchair, you know. So I was a little accomplice just when I was a baby in the buggy, you know. So that was my mum. But when, when I was five, she had this epiphany, she had this revelation, she had this dream and angels appeared and all that apparently and led her to a church around the corner and she went and she fell on her face. The, the, the pastor of the church prayed for her and she gave her life to God. And that, that became the worst thing for me because now I've got me dad trying to pull me into the kind of world that he knew and me mum trying to pull me off to the church and I became like this rope in a tug of war. So all the rows were around God, church, Christianity and my experience of God, church, Christianity was very, very negative. You know, I, if it, Jehovah's Witnesses used to knock on the door, I, would, I wouldn't just be rude to them, I'd chase them down the road. Because they'd come on a Sunday morning when I'd been up all night sniffing coke with that gun, with the gun, <laughs> or, or, or gas, or whatever I had at the time. I mean, I was the I was the biggest tool merchant in the area. Mm. There was there was a guy called Andy. I won't say his surname, but he was known. Everyone was scared of this guy called Andy. He was a few years older, and my dad had given me a box of it was VHS, Disney VHS tapes, like Hundred and One Dalmatians, all these because they sold. Um, and I had loads of them and I, and even the Stone Island and all of that, I remember having all the, I mean, yours is a, yours is a real one, but I remember having all the fake stuff, the jeans, Timberland, all of that sort of stuff, Caterpillar boots, all fake stuff. And I was making a lot of money selling it on the side. So I'd left a load of it in the room. Um, and we went to Baldock in Hertfordshire for a, for a few beers and that and came back. Someone that lived in this bed sit that I was living in, and my dad owned the house. He owned three houses on the, on the trot, the one we lived in the one either side that he, he rented out. And his, his dream was to get all the way up to the BP garage. There's about six houses. He wanted to own them all. So he was a real pioneer, a real visionary, you know, a real business mind, ent entrepreneur. Yeah. And he left me with hundreds and hundreds of pounds off of these fake clothes in my room. And this guy, Andy, had put the door in when I was out. 
And everyone was terrified of Andy. Um, but I wasn't. I was at the point now where my head was going a bit. The coke, you know, started, especially in the early days, I started to become quite nasty on coke. I was very violent. And everyone was like, you can't do anything about it. It's Andy. I was like, I can't do anything about it. Watch. And I remember my dad getting this guy, the one I spoke about earlier, he walked in with a gun and they went and put his door in and chased his dad out of the house and like, so he weren't there. Uh, but he was known as the tool merchant of the town. Like, he's always got a knife. He's always got some weapon. Stay away from him. He'll kill you. And he came, we found him in this pub one night and the doorman, I went out after him and the doorman shut the door behind me so I couldn't get back in and none of my mates could get out. And someone got, went up to my mate Steve, who's a right, very handy guy, the, his nickname's The Bear, boxer. Um, they went up to him and said, you better go out there and help Rob because it's him and Andy. And like Andy's a right tool merchant and Steve just laughed. He said, Rob's the biggest tool merchant around here, he'll be all right. Mm. And what I'd done is I'd planted in the, in the you know, outside the pub, there was this you know, garden area, little hanging baskets, all of that. And I'd put a, a lemon jiffy bottle, you know, for pancakes. Mm -hmm. and, and this was the advice of my dad's mate, who was the nutbag. Um, he said, empty that out and put ammonia in it. So I used to carry that in my pocket. And like sometimes drunk, I'd end up squeezing it in my own bloody pocket and it'd be going on my leg. And I'm thinking, why is my leg on fire? Farmer. Thankfully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Karma, exactly that. <laughs> Thankfully, I never did. But that, that was the sort of influence I had that, you know, if someone, cut, five men come up to you, he says, just take that out, squirt them all in the boat with it. Mm. Um, he says, you'll blind them and then you can just weigh them in, you know, so, he's, or, or gas them and have a bat. You know, my dad was like, you can always take out 10 men with two weapons, a can of gas and a bat, because why they can't see, you just take them all to piece, you know. So that was, even when I was at school, I was hearing this stuff. So there was that nasty streak to him, you know, there was. He was a rogue, but he also, he didn't suffer fools. Mm. So, my mum was like this Christian, my dad's this rogue, and I was just being pulled either side. He used to go to church to a youth group that she ran, and I remember loving it. Some of my mates from school were going, we were playing football, and there was a little God slot. My mum said, well, you can have the sweets and have the football, but you've got to have the God slot. And she'd give a little Bible reading or a Bible story. And I used to enjoy it, but I got to the age where it weren't cool. It, you know, it wasn't done. And if I talked to my mates about it, they would slag me off and mug, mug me off, so... I just ignored it and went my dad's way. My dad wanted exactly the same for me. My dad mm. didn't want me to be a doctor. He wanted yeah. to, me to be a, a drug dealer, yeah, yeah, yeah. violent, yeah. enforcer. Yeah. That's who he wanted me to be so he could go around and say to his yeah. Wally mates, yeah. yeah, my boy Liam, he's serving up and he's weighing yeah. this bloke in yeah, and he's yeah. doing that. And like he wanted, he wanted me to be the person that he couldn't, quite yeah, be himself yeah. and that's what impressed him being yeah. a being a villain yeah. and a gangster mm. when you've got an influence like that mm. you're up against the ropes before you've even entered the ring of course you are mm. yeah that's all you know and it's 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 the environment you're brought up in and like you know this this stuff that i'm dealing with now peace and ptsd depression mental health issues things like that, that's all from that mm. so the consequences are massive they it doesn't just stop the day you stop and turn your life around and that's, you know, coming from the church now that I'm a part of and all of that and new people around me, family that are, you know, that are totally opposite to that, to try and get them to understand the damages that that causes to the brain, the effects that has on your character. Um, it creates, some, it creates some, some real strengths, you know, to be able to overcome those things and give up coke and crack and those sort of things. It puts a, it puts a fighter, you know, a warrior-like spirit in you. But it also creates a lot of weaknesses and cracks in your, your character and, you know, and, and that hurts a lot of other people as well. You'll behave you because you you repeat that behavior and you don't want to. But it's like it's it, you just keep it's a natural path. You have to take a lot. It takes a lot of strength, a lot of willpower. And in my opinion, a lot of prayer and miracles to really get off that path that you've been on for so many years. It's all you've ever known. Um, and then to have this radical change like I did 18 years ago which I'm sure we'll get into, this radical experience that blew my mind and turned me away from a life of drugs and crime and made me want to follow Jesus. And, you know, I don't beat people up with the Bible. I've, that doesn't work. My mum tried that for years. But I'm an unashamed Christian. You know, I do believe Jesus saved my soul from hell. I believe that. That's not just like, oh, it's a better life, so I'll choose this better life. For me, it's, it's a radical inner transformation but yet that process is still working out all of your life. The rest of your life, you're outworking that new passion, new desire, new vision. And sometimes you've, you, you trip up. Sometimes you, the devil gets a grip on your foot again. 
and you end up just sliding back for a few days or or your mindset wobbles, you know, and, you, and you've got to keep reminding yourself. So it's a daily battle. It's not just an overnight fix. Mm. It's a daily fight. It's a daily war. And I always say, I go to the gym a lot. I see, you you know, you're following your posts. Now you're a gym guy as well. And we were saying earlier how that helps with mental health and all that. But, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not doing it to compete. I'm, I'm competing with me. Every day I'm in competition with me. I want to be better tomorrow. I want to be a better version of me tomorrow than I am sitting here right now. Yep. And, and that's not easy. No, it's a, it's all work in progress. Yeah. And it's, it's certainly character building. And I'll tell you what I say with the gym. Mm. I mean, I'm 44 yeah. years of age now. Yeah. I'm never going to be on the stage. Yeah. I'm never going to look like David Hasselhoff on yeah. the beach. Yeah. But I train for sanity, not vanity. There you go. It keeps, there you go. It keeps my mind in check. Yeah. Let's go back to the wobbly path that yeah. you was on. So mm. you was kind of off the rails anyway, yeah. but when your dad died and you had that painful exchange yeah. that can never be rectified, yeah. you went completely off the rails yeah. from there. So the first sentence I got was 18 months, which again is a miracle. Um, and the, 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 the charges was GBH, ABH, violent disorder, um, and carrying an offensive weapon. The offensive weapon then was a sock with wet sand in it, tied in a, a rugby sock. So... Me, we, I was always playing snooker. I was going to go pro. Like my dad got me into snooker. He, I think, although he lived that life, and he, when he saw that I was going that road, and he heard the stories of me down the pubs, and his, his mates were coming up to him, and his police mates were coming up to him and saying, "Did you know Rob smashed the guy's head in last night with an ashtray?" Or did you know? He, I think then he started to realise I've I've effed up. Mm. I've really. And he was trying then to deglamorize it, but it was too late. I was too I was too deep in now. I was kicking doors off for him. If someone owed him, you know, were overdue with their rent, I remember going with two of my mates one day, banging this guy's door in at midnight, making him get out of bed, making him ring my dad from his landline telephone. That's when people had landlines. Um, making him ring my dad up who was at home watching telly and saying, your son's here, because it was all for show. You know, I was in there and I was angry and I was drunk. And but, keen to impress your dad and, properly. That number one, mm. I was. It was. It was. I wanted to impress my dad, so I made him ring my dad up and say, "Your son's in here. I've got the money, and he's shaking, and he's trying to give me a thing. It's seventy-five quid or whatever it was." But I went home and like put the money on on in front of my dad. It is your money, dad. And my dad been t- wanting this guy's rent for for months or whatever. This overdue payment. Um, he weren't going to do anything about it, but I was. It was a small small amount of money, but for me, it was it was the moral of it. It was a it was a private. And I remember putting the money in front of my dad, thinking he's, he'd say, well done, son. And he just went, you mug. Kicking the guy's door off at midnight, you'll end up in bloody jail. What's wrong with you? You should have done it like this. And nothing I could do was enough. You know, whatever I did, no matter how violent, no matter how brutal, it wasn't done the right way. It wasn't, you know, because I wasn't a clever guy. I wasn't a, that's probably why I couldn't have ever been a real gangster, because I'd have been, I'd have been doing life a lot sooner, because I would have just... You know, I was just down the pub. I was so extrovert. I was so expressionate. Everyone knew what was going on in my head at the time because I couldn't hide it, you know. And so I went and gave him this money and he just he just slagged me off and called me all the names under the sun. And and anyway, we were at the snooker club and he said, I want to go and get some fags. Can I borrow your jacket? And I had this um, Ministry of Sound. Do you remember back in the day? Was it an MA1 or an MA2? Oh, I can't remember. Like Black Puffer Jacket. Bomber Jacket. Bomber did, Jacket. Did it have the collars Yes, off? it did. Yeah, That's yeah. MA2. Is it? Yeah. So you know a bit more than me. I know the one. And it had on the back Ministry of Sound. And the only reason I really wore it is because it made me look a bit bigger. Because mm-hmm. obviously they're padded, didn't they? We used to wear them on the door. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So it was a padded jacket. Um, and he said, can I put this on? I've, I've, I've got to go and get some fags. And I, I didn't remember that I'd got a uh, sock in it with ball bearings, two ball bearings in it. So if, obviously if it kicked off, I was pulling that out and swinging that around. And he found it because obviously he put his hand in, he felt the weight of it. And he was like, what's this? And he's like, you effing idiot. You hit someone like that, you're going to effing kill them and you'll end up in jail for the rest of your life. Just put wet sand in it. That just knocks them out. So that was, that gives you an idea of what he was like. He wasn't that extreme violent. Doesn't matter if I kill a man. He was a bit more calculated than me. He was a bit more... He was old, obviously got a wiser head on his shoulders, and he was like, just knock him out. Don't go to jail for life, but do a, a year's all right, two years all right mm. for a GB8. So I went back to his building yard, took the ball bearings out, put some sand in it, a little bit of water because it makes it go all clumpy. Um, the next night I'm in McDonald's in Hertfordshire, Letchworth. Big night out, Litton Tree pub. 
I used to run the drugs in there with another couple of guys. The doorman used to bring it in from London. So the security would bring the coke in and all that and speed back in the day. There was speed and all. Horrible. Uh, nastiest drug. That that was my first drug I got addicted to. I became a dealer of that. And I think that's worse than all of them. Like, it's just nasty, dirty, unclean drug. Anyway, so I'm on speed and I'm now dabbling in a line or two of coke. Back then it was coke. It wasn't what people are selling these days. You know, it's not cocaine, is it? Streets are full of whatever they're cutting it with. And um, the doorman would bring it in and I'd go in and the, the, the owner of the pub who took over didn't want me to be in there because he knew of my reputation. I was on pub watch from nearly all the pubs in town. I weren't allowed in any of them. And uh, anyway, so what they would do is I would go in with, with weapons on me drugs on me, whatever, and they'd pat me down dramatically in front of the manager, but he didn't know that they'd put up in the toilet behind the rad in the men's toilet, so they'd put, like, bags of coke and all sorts, so I'd go up there, after me pat down, they'd feel the weapons I'd got on me, they'd say, no, he's clean, and the manager's like, you sure? And they'd be like, yeah, he's clean, boss. So I'd go up, get the drugs from behind the radiator, and then go and start serving up in the pub. I would take the money, one of my mates would have the drugs on him by the fire, by the fire exit door. So he would just take the, he would, I'd take their cash, he'd, I'd send them over to me mate. And um, one of my mates come up to me and he says, I've just had a row at work with these Pakistani boys. I said, all right. And it wasn't a racial thing. It just happened to me that they were Asian and we were white. But they really made it out. It was all in the papers and that they made it out to be this big racial attack. It could have been a group of Chinese, a group of white guys. It didn't, it was just another group. It was just another gang of guys that were having a fight with one of my mates. So he said that they're here, you know, I think it's going to go off. And I remember grabbing me bottle of Budweiser or two, one in each hand. I said, right, we'll walk out together. Don't worry. So I got a few of the boys together. I said, look, I think it's going to turn over outside. Let's all be, let's all be ready for this. And they weren't there. So I said, all right, let's go and get a burger from McDonald's and we'll go back to mine and we'll get on it. So we go in McDonald's. We just ordered our food. We're sitting there and all of a sudden they all walk in. And they came for him. And he's jumped straight up in front of them. My other mate's got him, tried to, who is a good fighter, good boxer. He's got in the middle and he's genuinely trying to split it up. He was actually on a peaceful night out. He didn't want it to kick off this night. Although well, he was the right nasty bastard when he had to be. Mm. Um, but one of them just bang straight in his mouth. And then he turned. You know, he just went from, okay, I've just tried to split this up. And now it's going off. And chairs are going and... Some woman trying to run out the way, flying chair at her and the arm broke her arm. So there was all that going on. When they nicked me, they said, are you going to go not guilty like normal? And I said, yeah, of course I'm going not guilty. They went, before you say that, let me show you this. And it was CCTV in McDonald's. So what they thought at first was it was a kosh. Because what you see on the camera is me pulling something out of my the inside of this Ministry of Sound coat. Um, and it just looks, because of the, the camera you know, distortion and all that sort of stuff. It looked like a black object just being swung at the guy's head. But it was the sock with the wet sand in it. Obviously, it just all happened fast. So as it's kicked off, I've just pulled this sock out from my pocket. I already had my hand in there. I'm just waiting for it to happen anyway. I've pulled it out and just levered this guy with it. Now, he got hit with chairs. He got hit with fists. He got kicked around. All of them did. Big fight. The manager mistakenly trying to because there was other people outside. She didn't want more getting involved, so she locked the doors. So she locked us in there. So I was like, so we, no, one's, no one can escape. It's just bloodbath. Like a fight to the death. Yeah, it was fight to the death now. So eventually one of my mates ran and got the keys off and said, give me the keys because we've got to run. Um, and as we've gone out, the police are all now firing up the road, one-way street, but they're coming down the wrong way, you know, just to get there as fast as they can because they obviously the managing that had called Nell Bill. And I, I, I thought, I can't, I can't really fling this anywhere I can't, because I'll, they'll see me. So I'm trying to do it a bit sneaky and I just like let it go to the side off into the shop doorway next door to McDonald's. But they obviously found that. They had some witness statements. They had me on camera. So I had to go guilty. So it was the, the offence, the use and carrying of an offensive weapon. GBH, ABH and violence order where there's three or more involved in a fight where others are fra afraid for their life. So it's not quite a riot. But the guy had a fractured skull. He went into a coma for a couple of days. You're now You're lucky to get 18 months. Mm, that's the, the bar my barrister said to my mum, you've got the luckiest son in the world. And her response was, he's not lucky, he's got a praying mother. So she put it down to complete, miraculous, divine intervention. Mm. The barrister put it down to luck. He slumped in his chair when they said 18 months. And he said, I can't believe this. Like he, He'd prepped me for a minimum of five. Mm. Minimum. So that's why my dad was proud, because I was expecting, you know, I've gone in there half shaking in my boots, thinking I'm going to get a minimum of five, could be more. And I get 80 months. So obviously for me, I was just elated that I didn't get the five. What was your attitude like in court? Jack the lad, everyone look at me, look like I'm not afraid. Probably inside I was. 
Mm. But um, it was all it was all show. It was all show. I wanted my dad to think that I was a man. I wanted my mates to think I was a man. And some of us, as we went down, that they took us down the stairs, the holding cells, and some of my mates are fighting each other, pushing each other because. I got two years, the boxer got two years because the judge said your fists are weapons. Mm. And he's thinking, rightly so, he's thinking my fists might be weapons, but he's got a flipping, he's got a sock with wet sand in it. You know, so how I got less than him, we'll never know. I had one more charge than him, but I still got eight. We all got 18 months except me mate Steve, he got two. You probably got 18 months and two years rather than fives and sixes because it, yeah. wa it wasn't unprovoked. Yeah, it might be that. Like, and mm. the barrister played on that. They were having a quiet meal. They came yeah. in. They were defending themselves. So It was kind of fair game, but you just... Yeah, it went too far. Went a distance. Yeah. And there was innocent people that got hurt and all of that. So that was a miracle. How did you feel when you first got in that cell and realised you're now in jail for the first time? Well, with, there was five of us that all went out together and we all got we went to the same jail um, only. Why are Youth Offenders Institute only in, in Warwickshire? Um, I think we went. And I think I went to Norwich first. Did an induction there. That's medieval. That 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 I didn't like that. Rough. Yeah, rough. I was only there for three or four weeks, but obviously uh, we weren't there long enough to do the induction and go into the mainstream prison. So it was twenty three hour lock up. We literally just got let out to get our food straight back up, and I was sharing a cell with my mate Chris. And we were getting like flipping. We were getting sleeping tablets and crushing them up and snorting them and all that sort of stuff. Just and doing a thousand, trying to do a thousand press ups, it just, just all bravado. Trying to, you know, we read the Ch Ch Charles, Charlie Bronson's books and all that. It was all just trying to impress each other. That's all it was. Now I'm not saying every gangster or wannabe gangster out there is like that, but for me, I'll hold my hands up and say I was an insecure, scared little boy, really, that didn't get that loved properly by daddy, and was just trying to impress everybody. That's all I think it was. But I did obviously. The more you go into it, it you become calloused to it, don't you? You become hardened mm. to it. So the more people I beat up, the more I found it easy to beat someone up. Mm. Um, and I, I became less remorseful the next day. My dad said to me that he heard the guy that went into the coma. I remember him saying, and I'd watched Rocky. I'd watched the side, another line off of another movie, and my dad said, "I hear that that guy's going to die." And I said, "If he dies, he dies." That was that was that was the line, you know, for <laughs> you know um, Rocky Four. Remorseful Rob. Yeah, remorseful Rob. I said, "If he dies, he dies. He shouldn't have punched James in the face." And my dad just looked at me horrified. Were you big on protecting your friends? Massive. And that's the saddest thing of it all is, when I turned my life around and became a Christian, uh, and when, so, when I got really bad on the crack, because Coke was accepted by most of us, because mo near enough all of us were on it, and most of us were selling it, a lot of it. Um, but when it went to the crack, for me, I ended up giving in one day, went to get my usual hit of Coke. My, my dealer didn't have any Coke, but he says, I've got this. And I was like, I don't touch that, that's, that's like heroin. Um, but I needed something, so I gave in and I took a bit of crack and I loved it. And when I took the crack, mate, I, you know, I'd only do coke if there wasn't crack around, you know. Um, and then I became a bit of a junkie to my mates. It, it went from Rob being one of us to I, I started to lose friends. I started to get very, very psychotic, um, taking friends hostage for, you know, a few hours at knife points. I thought they were talking about me, they were going to kill me. Um, seeing things, hearing things, you know, it, it went dark quick. Is this after you come out of jail the first time? Uh, so first time I was, um, was I 17? You're yeah. in jail, you got the 18 months. Yeah, I got 18 months. You, you do, you, you're you sniffing sleepers and doing yeah. doing press-ups. Yeah, yeah. Reading Charles Bronson books. Yeah, all of that, craze books. Yeah, so I'm trying to work, I, I want to know sort of how you behaved in jail. Mm. Did it teach you a lesson? When you come out, how did, okay. you, how did you act? Okay, good question. The first time I came out of the first sentence, my mates picked me up in a 15-seater stretch limo. Because I wanted to be, I wanted to be the man. Um, so I think I probably suggested that. It wasn't like that they just did it. Picked me up. Jail didn't change me. I, you know, for me, it was it was just a career ground. You know, it was just to learn from other bigger gangsters. And, you know, I got in with this guy called Scouse from Liverpool, obviously. He was shorter than me, but he was a nasty, nasty bastard. You know, he was making all the hooch for us for Christmas so, that, so we could all get smashed. Mm. And I was down the gym with him. That's when I started to get a bit of a love for the gym. Um, and I noticed that I had good genetics and good strength for someone that had come from, you know, a bit of drugs and all that. I wasn't so bad then on the drugs. It was afterwards, after my dad died, that's when I went dark, dark into it. Um, and I was 21 when he died. So leading up to that, I was getting worse on the coke. But when he died, it went messy. Um, so prison didn't change me. I was angry in prison. I was fighting in prison. Um up playing pool and snooker and all that. They had a snooker table in the first show I went to, which I love because I was a you know really keen snooker player. Um, you know, we'd we'd go out together. We'd meet up at the chapel every Sunday because we were on different wings, the five of us. They split us all up. 
So that was a way of us just, we weren't there for God. We weren't there for the for the sing song. We were there for the biscuits and just like get together and how's your, how's your day going, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the gym, you know, if we could try and mingle at the gym a little bit, we would. So prison didn't change me. I came out, picked up in this 15-seat limousine, nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, my mate pulls out a bit bag of Coke, stuck one, had a little bump in the back of the limo, drinking beers, go to probation to sign my name to say, I promise to be a good boy, blah, blah. I'm on obviously license. Um, they'd organise a party for me at the local Free Magnets, like a Weatherspoons pub. Straight in there, uh, within a day or two, I'm scrapping and I'm back on the drug. It didn't change me at all. I didn't come out and think, right, that's it. I've got a better in my life. I came out and I was like, right, I'm gonna, I've done jail now. So now people are really going to be scared of me. You know, mm. It didn't change me at all. If anything, it made me a lot worse. It bolstered your profile. Yeah, it bolstered my profile. Yeah, that's what that's what I wanted to get an understanding yeah, yeah. of. Yeah, if, yeah. Uh, if it, if it had, a, had an effect to... No, not in a positive way at all. No, I came out, a mate of mine had, um, had joined a sentence later on. Um, one of our mates had grasped him up for something, which what he'd done was bang out of order, this lad. Um, but obviously my mate shouldn't have grasped him up. And when he told me that he'd grasped him up, I said, the day I get out, I'll sort him. And I think it was about three days after being out, I went and kicked this guy's door in, took one of my mates with me. Um, I'm sitting there like I'm sitting here with you having a word with this guy. And, you know, I wasn't actually going to weigh him in. I was planning to as a door winning, but he was so scared and so sort of remorseful and all these excuses. I sort of started to feel a little bit of compassion for him. But then his dad, who was standing there in his boxers, because obviously we'd woke the house up, and he's arguing, rightly so, because we've just put, you know, banged his door and stuff, and we're standing in his living room, and it's one o'clock or whatever in the morning. He, he made a step towards me, and I don't know what he was planning to do, but as he stepped towards me, my mate who was standing next to me just chinned him, knocked him over the coffee table, and then obviously my mate ran out, the, the other guy ran out of the house. Police were there before we even got back to my, my where I was standing at my mum and dad's at the time. And I was back in the cells within three days. But he retracted his statement and all of that because, you know, we, we put the fear of God in him. He retracted his statement and then I didn't get anything for that one. You know, it was just basically a slap on the wrist. I think my mate got a probation. He had to do some community service for it. But because I didn't actually wait, lay a hand on anybody, they mm. let me off for it. So, yeah, it didn't change me. It made me worse. It bolted my my. I'd learned from Scouse and his others a language. You know, I was like, actually, and they loved me. For some reason, I think I was a lovable rogue and all. Um, these real gangsters took to me and they thought this guy's, you know, there's something about him. You know, someone sold us some fake steroids, like some fake Dynabol tablets. So I went out into the yard and chinned him and that, that made them all think, oh, he's a, good, he's a good lad. So again, I was just trying to impress people. Anyone that was like a father figure, or a, mm. I just wanted to impress. That's it. It was it was just insecurities, major insecurities. Validation from big men. Yeah, validation from from men that are feared, loved, or respected for something or another. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to be affirmed by them. Yeah, because you had a, you went to jail a second time, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. So between your first jail sentence mm. and your second jail sentence, and we'll find out what that's for when we yeah. get to there. Yeah. What was life like during that stint, and how long was it before you went back in? Yeah. Um, the second one, I was 19. Right. So I was 19 because I got out just before my dad died. Um, that, But in that year and a half or so period, I think that's when I started to go a bit darker, you know, because I had been in prison with real real boys, real men that had taught me stuff and that I'd, I'd heard stories of guys torturing people for, you know, they hadn't paid up. And so I came out the first sentence. That's when I went back onto the drugs, you know, the coke straight away, started selling it. I would only just have enough to pay my dealer on the on the following Friday after taking a nine bar off him just because I'd sniffed all the profit myself. But then he'd give me another one for two weeks on tick for two weeks. That time I could only pay him half because uh, I'd sniff more than more than the profit. And I was like, you know, people owe me money. And he's like, you better get it off him. Otherwise I have to come to you. Uh, and it just started to get worse and worse and worse. My habit. So now I'm sniffing like. You know, I'd go out on a Friday night and whereas a gram used to last me a weekend when I was 16, now I'm doing a gram in the photo booth by Stevenage train station before we went in the nightclub, you know, because I didn't want to just have to piss around with it and go to the toilet every 10 minutes. So I just I just calf crushed it up with a, with a coin or whatever and then just sniffed the whole thing and then walked into the club, bouncing off the walls. Um, vodka and Red Bull, all of that. Vodka turned me nasty. If I had vodka, m all my mates used to ask me if I said, Vodka, they'd ask, would you stay around? What do you want? Vodka. Nah, Rob, come on. Have a beer, mate. Because they knew that I would go from being a jolly, yappy, quite high, bit of a joker, to the vodka I would turn nasty. You know, I just wanted to fight the whole world. And they knew that that meant that they were going to fight because they're not going to leave me on my own. So I got on the vodkas and the Red Bull and the Coke. And it was just that for 
day in, day out, every weekend. And then the, the weekends became four day benders. They became five day benders. And then a lot of them then started to withdraw a bit from me because they went, we touch it on a Friday and Saturday, but we work the rest of the week. Now I'm missing work. I can't get up in the morning. I'm making excuses to me, dad. You know, I'm the, the relationship between me and him is getting very, very tense because he's hearing stories about me. I'm not turning up for work. I'm letting him down when I'm at work because I can't perform. Um, so it just became a two year deeper into the drug addiction. I'd say those are the days where I became a real addict mm. before I got the, the second sentence. And what was that for? That's the biggest miracle of all. It was during the World Cup and I'm in a pub with my cousin David, a couple of others, and we're watching the game. I forget what game it was. It was the one before Brazil because I remember I remember when they the police pulled me into the meat wagon. I remember being gutted thinking I'm going to miss the, the next game and I think the next game was England v Brazil. So anyway, we're watching the game and these two women were on a table next to us. They're having a good jolly up and all. And then they just kept standing in the way of the telly. So I remember just saying, can you move out of the way? And I was being polite at first, but then they were just drunk. And then I think I got a bit rude, you know, my sort of, can you get out the effing way? And there was a bit of an argument. And I didn't know she was, one of them was the mum of another guy I went to school with, who, thank God, now we're, we're quite friendly guy called Darren, lovely guy, and he, he he did what any other son would have done whose son was just deaf and blinded at their mum. He got told he was in another pub watching the game. He came looking for me. So he came through the doors. Um, we've all gone outside. My cousin's trying to stop me fighting him. He's, you know, he's got some of his mates holding him back. It was one of them handbags at 50 paces and all of that. Nothing, no punches were thrown. It was just all everyone trying to sort of split it up come on, we just won the, you know, just everyone just get along, you know. But mm. we, I, I hadn't slept for three days. Um, I don't know if he was on drugs. I don't think I don't think he was. I think he was just a boozer. Um, but then I felt like I'd been mugged off because all of my gang, my real mates had gone, I think they'd gone to Thailand or somewhere to watch the, the, the football and I couldn't afford it because I was so bad on the drugs. And so they're all not, they're not, they're not there and I'm on my own really. My cousin's not a fighter. He's, he's a sensible, he's got a good head on him. The people I was with were all splitting it up. If it had been my mates there, it would have gone right off. Mm. But thankfully, it wasn't. And But I felt like I'd lost a bit of pride. I felt like, you know, he's come and he's fronted me in front of people and my cousin and I've got to do something about this. Um, and I hadn't slept for three days. I'd been bang on the coke, you know. I'd been dragging myself out of the house just to get to the football, sticking the big line at me just to sort of straighten me out a little bit. Um, and I remember I had to, I was known... I, <laughs> I, 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 this is how bad I was, how insecure and stupid I was. I had a tall wall. We called it the tall wall. So in my bed sit flat um, that my dad owned, in my room, I had a wall, sort of one of the bedroom walls, and I'd nailed all different weapons in it, including the bloody hedge trimmer, a chainsaw, like all that sort of stuff, pickaxes, knives, knuckle dusters, things that I bought back from Spain. This You wouldn't get away with it now, I don't think, but I'd... Uh, one in Macy's, you know, like in Braveheart, the, the ball with the spikes on it, mm -hmm. you know. So I had one of them. I took that in a bloody pub in Baldur. We'll get to that later on. The whole pub had to run out because I was swinging this bloody thing around in the pub like a madman. So I went I went back to the tall wall and I was like, right, I've got to go and get a weapon. And I, I stopped a guy in the street and made him drive me up the road to Letchworth, which is a mile up the road. And I didn't know that he knew this guy, Darren. And so I'm shouting and screaming the whole way there. I'm going to kill this guy. You know, I was just, I was off my head. There was no decorum. There was no sense about what I was planning. I just wanted to, I wanted to scare him or at least get some sort of pride back because mm. he had all of his mates of him. And we, we, we all became good friends in the end. We all sort of, like, there was these rivalries between different estates. And then as we got a bit older, we matured a bit. And I think they had to buy drugs off us because they couldn't get it from anywhere else. All of a sudden, we had to be friends with each other. Bit of respect there as well. Yeah, we grew up a bit. You know, we, we grew up a bit. But I was just an idiot. I take full responsibility for it. And as we as we got back, so I made him wait, and I'm looking at what weapon should I get. If I take the knife, they'll easily get that off me, and then I'm just going to get stabbed up. Um, the gas, oh, it's a windy day. You know, I'm all these things. It was literally just trying to plan enough. No, I'll take the gun. I'll just, I'll just scare the shit out of them. That was what my plan was. So my plan was to go back to the pub where I thought that they were, burst through the doors like a madman, everyone get on the fucking floor. That was, like, that was all going through my head. That, that was my, me planning on the coke, you know, obviously not in my right mind. Um, and as I get there and I'm, and I'm hyping myself up because I'm scared. I actually, when I realised I'd been giving it all the bigging in the car and I'd made all these, you know, drug-induced claims... As I started to come to my senses a little bit, and maybe the adrenaline was wearing off a little bit, I was thinking, what am I doing? Mm. 
but mm. I'd already committed, you know? So as I'm standing outside the pub waiting to go in and do that, he'd actually gone to another pub. So what I just hear from behind, oh, Joy, what are you going to do? Shoot me. And fair play, he didn't know if it, was, if it had bullets in it or not, but he didn't care. He just came with a group of his mates and as I turned around, he's kind of on me already. He's, he's already there. And I didn't have time to do anything. I just pulled out and hit him on the side of the head with the butt of the gun. He's thrown a punch at me. I've gone on at the floor. The doorman have come out of the pub. His mates have all jumped in. Someone's kicked me in the face as I'm on the floor. My shoe came off. Um, I've ended up having to run off to another pub around the corner by the train station um, and by the engine pub. I don't know if you know Bulldog at all. There's, there's two pubs there by the train station, the engine and the white horse. So I've run in the white horse and I'm in the toilet trying to clean myself up and get myself sorted out. And I'm on the phone with my mate Terry. Um, come from Stevenage and pick me up. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get banged up because the gun had come out my hand and the doorman had the gun. Mm -hmm. So they rung the police. Obviously, the police came and they went, as I'm going out, Terry's pulled up. I've seen out the window. The, dark, the, 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 door start, uh, the, the bar staff must have known that some maniac just ran into the toilets. He's been in there a long time. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I see Terry's car. I'm thinking, right, I'm going to quickly run in and get out and just get away. Um, but the meat wagons, boom, boom, just like, and he just had to drive his car off quietly. And they came out with proper guns and like their guns are real and big and mine weren't. And they were like, get on the floor. So I just get on the floor. They cuffed me up, throw me in the back of the wagon and I'm, I'm off. I'm off to the station and I know I'm, I'm going away. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going away for a, a long one there. And I remember the only thing in my head was, oh, I'm going to miss the, I think it was Brazil. I'm going to miss the England-Brazil game. I'm going to miss the fucking England-Brazil game. I was fuming about that. It's good that you had your priorities right. Priorities were right. I'm so <laughs> patriotic, yeah. And, and I remember when I got to Bedford, I, I got sentenced, I, I went on remand, went to Bedford prison, shared a cell with this old gangster friend of my dad's, the one that came down the garden. He's in the same bloody cell as me. Um, don't know what he'd done. Um, he's rolling spliffs and all that and passing, you know, I'm on the bottom bunk, he's on the top. You thought it ain't so bad. It ain't so bad. <laughs> um, and they, and, the, and back then they had, they just brought in tellies into the cells. They just introduced TVs into the cells. So I got to watch bloody football. So I was over the moon, I'm smoking a joint with the other, the guy, the guy that I wanted to be a, be the gangster like. Yeah, you know, yeah. He was my biggest influence, you know, in my, my, I'm aspiring to be like this guy. And, uh, and I'm like, he's in the cell with me. I'm like, happy days. But, but yeah, to be getting banged up for pistol whipping someone yeah. and land in the cell with him, exactly. you, must, you was, must have thought this would impress him. Exactly, exactly that. And he then started to say to me, I've been hearing a lot about your boy. He used to call me boy. He's like, I've been hearing a lot about your boy. And, and i never forget the words because I thought that meant I've arrived. Mm. His exact words were, I'm hearing stuff. You're even fucking crazier than me. And I remember going, yeah. You'll take that. I'll, I'll have that. That's that was that was that was an affirmation. I'm, hmm. I'm I'm crazier than, which means that I've got more of a reputation than, and people are talking about me more than, and it, and it just fed me. It fed that little boy. It fed that little boy that food that he'd been craving in a perverse way, you know. And so that's why now with my own kids, which we'll get into, I'm sure, I'm massive on affirming them. They, you know, I tell them I love them all the time. Who loves you? You, Papa, like. You know, why do I love you? And then the answer always has to be, they, they used to say, because I'm good at this? Nope. Because I, I do that? I, nope. Just because you're my son. Just because, that's it. So I make them know I love you. And the only reason I love you is because you're my son. Not because of anything you do. Not because of any achievement. Not because of any success. Just because you're mine. Let them know it's unconditional. It's unconditional. And it's without performance and you don't have to earn it or deserve it or prove it. It's just given freely. Which I get the revelation from the Bible for that, you know, that God so loved the world. You know. Is that a subconscious, don't think you have to go and do anything silly Definitely. to, to impress yeah, me? Yeah, or, or even anything successful. Like, do it, do it, go and be a success. I want you to, I want to push you towards success in any area of your life. But don't do it because you're trying to impress me. You've already got my attention because you're my blood. Mm. You've already got my love because you're my son, you're my daughter. You don't have to earn it. It's given freely. You can't, you can't lose it. It's not going to get taken away. You know, so I lived in that place of, oh, he's proud of me now, but if I do this, he won't be proud of me. He's proud of me. So it was like just, it was just standing on, on wet sand all my life, you know, and there was no stability to me. And so two years, you know, they, they, what they did was, because I was known for threatening witnesses by then, the police knew what we were like. There'd been another massive fight in the White Lion pub just up the road where they, they put it in the, in the Comet newspaper. So the first time I went to prison, the headline was seven youths sentenced in Big Mac brawl because it was in McDonald's. So they, 
I was like, great journalism, that one. Big Mac brawl. <laughs> I see what you've done there. Yeah, I see. I was like, well done. <laughs> Not so subtle, that one, mate. Um, anyway, so then there's this other big fight. Hit this guy with a chair bar stall. He got really hurt. And so we were back in the Comet again. It was some, something like the Wild West. They, they, they made it out to be like a Wild West fight. Because it was. It was just like they this gang from the, another state came in. It went mental. But they were back in the day. Yeah, they were. They I, were don't, proper... I, I don't see so much of that nowadays. No, it's all knives and... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, back in the day when it was pubs and clubs yeah. and estates, yeah. it was always five, six people yeah. either side yeah. and it was a free-for-all. Just a mosh, yeah. Mm. And that's what we were like. And, and we thrived on that and we loved it. Um, but anyway, the police were hunting us for that. And the main witness, who was the barman, a guy called Craig, who again we've, we've become all right with because me and my mate Rob knocked on his door one morning and he answered the door. And I remember the exact words from me and my mate. I can't remember which one of us actually said it. It was like, you go to court, next time someone knocks on your door, it'll be your mum who answers or someone that you love that'll answer the door and we won't be standing here friendly. And then we took him to the golf club gravely um, we said, let's buy you some lunch. And we bought him some lunch. We said, this is what you're going to do. When we get to court, it was at Luton Crown. When we get, uh, he goes, I won't turn up. I won't turn up. I said, no, you're going. You've got to turn up. Um, otherwise, it'll be obvious. I said, you turn up and you you turn up ready to tell your s- story that you've given a statement to already, which was, I saw, he named us. I saw them. I saw Rob Joy do this. I saw Rob do this. Another guy called Rob. I said, you turn up. But as they start to examine you in, in the interview, that you you just say, I think it was, I think I saw Rob do it. I'm not sure. It might have been one of the others. I said, that's all you've got to do. And I told him embarrassed what the plan was. And he obviously just jumped in with reasonable doubt. And the judge went, it's obvious what's happened here. That was exact words. It's very obvious what happened here. But he said to the jury, but I, I encourage you to find them not guilty because there's reasonable doubt. So he came out, not guilty. We smiled. Walked out. So the police were fuming about that. The old Bill hated that because they really wanted us for that one. They thought that was the one that was going to give us a bigger sentence because they were they were they were very angry at the eighteen months and the two. Year, they, they wanted something big. So because of the reputation there, they said if you plead guilty to the there was a GBH for that for that fight. I just said when I hit the guy with the gun, um, there was a racially aggravated ABH that I was already on remand for or on bail. Sorry, on bail for. A guy was in the pub, Goldcrest pub in Baldock. This is all the same. These pubs are all so close to each other that we just terrorised them all. And he started talking German. It was during a game of football. And he was talking, he's an English guy. And he's talking to these two German, you know, they've come over for work or whatever. And he's talking to him in German because he knew German. And that just incensed me because at the time, because of my dad's influence and other influences, I was a bit of a, um, you know, the, the England v Germany, all that kind of stuff. You know, I weren't even alive for it, but it was, you know, you don't talk to Germans. Germans are the scum of the earth. Kind of. And I just went crazy because he's talking Germans. And I'm like, they're in our pub. They're in our country. They're coming over here. It's one thing that we're letting them to having a drink, but I don't need you talking. And because I ended up chinning this guy, they said it was all racially aggravated. So I'm on, I got sentenced for that. So that was a racially aggravated ABH. There was a GBH. And then there was obviously the gun. So... What they said was, if you plead guilty to these charges, we'll drop the gun. And the gun was the one that was going to give me the, the real time. Even though it wasn't the real gun, it was it was still a gun that I'd taken out and I'd use as a weapon. So they were saying that that not getting dropped, that's a minimum of five. So you're looking at more, but that's a minimum of five for this charge, just taking the gun out of the house. So obviously I had to go guilty because I thought, I'll take this, I'll take this deal. Um, and I got two years for it. Again, miraculously. Years later, I ended up getting invited to speak at a church in America and I had to go to the, get the visa and I spoke to the immigration there and I'm doing all the paperwork, blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, um, you've got this sentence of a gun. You've got this charge of a gun. Obviously, we can't let you into America with a with gun. I said, no, 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 that got dropped. That got dropped. And he just looked at me and smiled. He went, it never really gets dropped. <laughs> so what they did was they put, instead of it being a weapon, they just put on the, on the rap sheet the confiscation and destruction of a handgun. So they just wanted it to just be there on my on my record, yeah. Which sport me going to this event that I was gonna, you know, I was gonna speak to a load of ex prisoners and convicts and drug addicts and and give them some hope, but I I couldn't do it. So yeah, I got two years for that. Then I come out again. I just got worse in prison. I started taking a bit of steroids in there and training and eating. I could you know paying somebody, getting my girlfriend at the time to send money to the guy that worked in the canteen. Because um, you're only allowed a certain amount on your on your canteen list, you know how much money you're allowed to spend a week on your phone card back then. I don't know if it's changed now if they've 
modernise it, but you had a phone card, which we used to shave the edges and all that and get 40 units out of a 20 unit and all these sort of things. Um, and I was buying these nourishment, strawberry nourishment cans that you get in some of the cheap sort of corner shops now. Lovely though, aren't they? Ah, oh, they'll do for, yeah, they do for a bit of protein, but they're full of, full of crap. Oh, real, yeah. real bad. Yeah, they really are. But that was the only sort of proteiny type thing you could get. And what I used to get, I used to get this girlfriend, Cla- uh, Clara, Clara at the time, to send money to this other guy who didn't have anyone sending money into him. You know, so I think it was £10 a week you were allowed or something stupid then. And he, he had no one giving him money. So I said, look, I'll get my girlfriend to send you tenner a week um, so I can spend double. And obviously out of that, I'll give you a phone card or something like that and looked after him a little bit. Um, and then there was another guy who worked in the canteen. I sent him a tenner a week and all. And he had to give me 10 eggs a day. Um, so it, every morning, as soon as the cells were open, the canteen guys had already been let out their cells to start getting breakfast ready. And he'd sort of walk in with 10 raw eggs in a little plastic bag and he'd put them under my pillow. So I was, I was making my own protein shake, Marvel milk powder, strawberry nourishment and 10 raw eggs, shaking it up in a plastic bottle and banging it back, training every day. And I started to get quite a lump. You know, I started training with this guy, Jesse, was back, he's, he's, my, he's next to me in the cell. Me and him were just outside. You know, we had a pack of cards. If you turned over and it was an eight of spades, you had to do eight press-ups. If it was a nine of clubs, you had to do nine star jumps and, you know, whatever the four exercises were. And we went through a pack and then we started doing two packs because we were getting fitter and stronger. And I started to really love that. And I came out of there bigger, stronger, a bit more mature. I'd grown a bit. I'd become a little bit more hardened. Still as angry? Worse. Yeah, I think I'd got worse. Yeah, I'd, I'd had time to fester and lie there every night on my own. You know, even if you do a small sentence, a few weeks is enough to send a man a little bit mad, I think, when he's on his own every single night with his thoughts. And especially if them thoughts aren't p- positive ones, that, you know, your memories aren't positive. Mm. And I think I just, I think I let it get to me a little bit. And I went a little bit, you know, I went a little bit insane, I think, a little bit, a little bit more nasty. Um, Dark. A bit darker. They're the words. And I'll sh- I've got them on my phone. I'll show them to you after the interview. Um, the picture of the mugshots. And you can you can even see from from the first one, 16, having to go at the cop, I swear in, a little bit of, you know, abuse of a policeman. Nothing. To see. And then the one where I've got a black eye after the incident with a gun and they punch me in the face. And you can just see the eyes. The eyes have changed. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lost soul there now. The, mm. the soul's pretty much gone. And um, so I came out and my mate was selling a lot of coke and he, he was owed a lot of money. And so I said, and I, and I wanted to get back on the coke. I, you know, I was missing sniffing the coke, so I started sniffing again. Um, but I had no way of getting any job. No, no one wanted to employ. I was unemployable, really, with my reputation. So I said to him, what about this? What, what's your tick list like? You know, how many people owe you money? And he, he was owed something like 15 grand or something, nothing ma- major. And I said, well, I'll, you know, you guys, I just can't get it in. They just won't pay up. I said, I'll get it in. But every, whatever it was, every 200 I collect, you've got to give me a bit of Coke or whatever. So he wasn't paying me cash. He was just paying me with, with, for me sniff. So I'm ringing up all these people off this list and got the money in within a week or two um, just by saying it's Rob Joy. I'm, you know, and, you know, like I say, I weren't the worst out there, but people knew if they, they could beat me with their hands, but I would always come back. I think we, t- we touched on that earlier, the same sort of mindset. You know, it was if they beat me with their hands, I'd come back with an ashtray or a bat. You know, I just wouldn't give up because that pride in me. Mm. And so I, uh, I got the money in fairly quickly, but obviously all of it was going up my nose. I was on tag for that one for three months. That was what I wish I'd have just stayed in for it. I, I regretted doing the tag just to get out, out f- you know, three months early. That felt more like prison because 7 p.m., just as all my mates, had, you know, we'd been out all day. And just as they're about to really get smashed and, and on, the, on the sniff and all that, I had to go home. So I just like, you know, they had to drag me home. I'd said to them, you know, you, you're going to have to force me home some nights because I'm not going to want to go back in. So they, you know, the decent mates, they picked me up. They said, come on, we're getting you in the cab. They walked me through the door, shut the door. We're not going out, Rob. We're staying in ourselves, you know, all that. And I knew they weren't. And I'd, I'd be like sniffing in the flat, waiting till seven in the morning when, the, when I was allowed out, just so I could go back to this mate, mate's house and collect more coke. So you'd, you'd be doing drugs on your own? Oh, on my own. By this stage. And that's when it went dark. Mm. That's when it went dark because it wasn't a party drug anymore. It wasn't just, it was just me sniffing, being on my own, and I'm starting to see things and hear things and the curtains... And moving, I, I would even, I would even be like dodging because I'd see, I'd see a copper in a tree opposite me flat window. I'd swear that he was there. I was adamant. And then like my girlfriend at the time or a mate that was on the, you know, had come round for a night on the bag with me. I'd say that they're, they're watching me. The, the the whole place must be wired, and they're looking out the window going, Rob, there's no one there, mate. 
And so then I'm going, you must be in on this. You're the one who's called him then because he's definitely there and you're telling me you can't see him and you've got two eyes in your head. So then, then I'm starting to turn on him or turn on her, my girlfriend, or whoever it was that was saying, Rob, there's no one there. Because to me, there was. Mm. And I'm even seeing a red dot going on me. Like I'm thinking they've got a gun on, they've got a, they've got a gun on. Someone's called a hitman. Someone's, someone that I've beaten up has got a cousin or an uncle and all these, you know, I just started to go wild in my mind. Very wild. How much cocaine were you using to, mm. to start hallucinating like that? I think it wasn't so much the cocaine, it's the, it's the sleeplessness. You know, oh, the sleep deprivation. Yeah, the sleep deprivation. So obviously it's the coke as well. But it was like normally on the third night of no sleep, you know. So, you you know, you want to come down, but you're just staying alive on mm. on, on a bag of crisps and the booze and the, and, the, and the coke. So it's not normally the first night. First night, I was normally like party mode. Second night, I'm starting to feel a bit angsty. And then by the third night, if I've carried on, I'm seeing people in trees. So it was more that, I think, you know, but obviously I was shoveling a fair amount. Like I said, when I was 16 and I started taking coke, it, a gram lasted a weekend. You know, it was two or three lines and then, you know, you'd go home and, and then you'd carry on for a weekend and then you'd stop and you didn't have the money because you're 16, you know, so you couldn't get any more until the following weekend um, unless you could tick it or something. But when I was selling it and I had it all wrapped around me, I mean, I would do, I'd do a gram in a couple of lines easy, you know, and people used to say, I, I found out years after I stopped taking coke, years after, um, I mean, it's been 18 years since I've turned my life around and there'd been a f about three or four blips in that time years ago where I'd, something happened, an emotional trauma or something and I would I would wobble and go and have a beer and then I'd have a line or something and then I'd be pull myself back in and get back onto the, on the church wagon, so to speak. Um, but back in the day, people used to say, and then I found out years later, they still say it in that area. So say there's two lads like this having a beer and they'd say, do you want a line? He'd say, yeah. And he's like, do you want a small line, a big line or a Rob Joy special? That's what they used to say. Because I got to the point where, as you understand, I'm sure, like a small line, normal line weren't touching me. So it, they had to get bigger and thicker and longer and fatter. And it got to the point where I'd have to have a mirror um, and like I'd, I'd have to line it up from, from the, the, this point to this point because it was the longest, longest point. And, mass, and I'd almost have to have a run up to sort of like, you know, because I just had to smash so much into me in one go. With a traffic cone. Yeah, traffic cone, all of that. <laughs> I mean, I've got a hole that goes through the middle of my nose still. So if I, like that side collapses because the, the, obviously cocaine's got like an acid in that in it, isn't it? And it, if it's real, back then it used to be real stuff. And so obviously that, the damage that was doing to me, my nose membrane and to my own brain and all of that. And so then, yeah, I'm smashing big chunks in, you know, an eighth in a night easily, you know, and sometimes more. Depends who I was with. Some of them were, you know, you'd the, the conversation would be more, let's do a business plan and all that because, you know, and you'd get caught up in that. But some of them just wanted to get absolutely trolleyed and it, you, I'd go along with that. So the amounts, I can never tell you exactly, but, you know, an eight foot in a night, easy carrying on to the next day. Lots. Lots of it. Just smashing it. Just smashing it. And obviously the booze and all that, no sleep, no food, no nutrients going in my body. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing people in the trees. So not, not that I'm condoning. Yeah going out taking drugs. Yeah. But there's use and there's abuse. But yeah, definitely. And I was abusing. Yeah. Totally abusing. Well and truly in that bracket. Oh, 100%. Like, I, I, I'd ring my sister up who lived up the road on the estate um, and I'd say to her, get down there, get down there, they're coming to get me, they're coming to get me. You know, because then everyone had gone home. Like, mates, they knew when to leave, a lot of them, because they were like, I mean, I'd, I'd have a mate sitting there and I'd start, I'd, I'd think that he's hidden somebody in the sofa with him. Mm. Uh, in my head, I'd see the sofa moving where he's sitting in, or he, he would just shuffle something funny on the sofa, like, or he'd look behind him and I'd go, what's he, what's he doing? What's he looking at? And then I'd be, like, he'd be talking to me like you're talking to me now, but I'm not, I'm not listening, I'm not hearing a word he's saying, I'm just looking at the sofa. And I'm like, no, I, I think he's, got, he's put something in there, he's called the old Bill and they're hiding in there and they're listening to everything we say and he's trying to trap me and my head was gone. And then I'd, get, I'd, I'd say, stay there, stay there, Stu, and I'd go and get a knife out of the kitchen and I'd come and I'd say, stab it. And then I'd just start, not it stabbing him, but stabbing the sofa. And he's like, what are you, like, he's shitting himself. What are you doing? I'm like, he's in there, isn't he? And I'm thinking I'm stabbing into the sofa, thinking there's a man in there or cops in there or something. And there's no one in there. And then I'm seeing out the corner of my eye, the, the, the curtain move, you know, the curtains are blowing and, and someone's coming through the windows. So and then I'm up and down at the window every two seconds. And it just sent me into a very bad place. So I got diagnosed as being a paranoid schizophrenic, but drug-induced psychosis is what it really is, or what it really was. Um, I rang my sister up and she would come and she'd walk me up the road to hers at three in the morning in her dressing, in her nightie, a dressing gown. 
put me into the spare bedroom, trying to just stroke my hair because obviously I hadn't slept for three or four nights and I'm so wired now I can't sleep. So she'd sit there with me while I'm like this every two seconds and, you know, she'd be like, her daughters, my nieces are in the other room, Rob, you can't, come on, you know, Danelle and Mariah are in, the, in, in their beds asleep, can't wake them up. And, you know, you can trust me, I'm your sister, I love you and just trying to be calming and stroke my hair, you know, and even one of my mates, Chris did it for me once, I was so off it. He just had to just, he said, right, just lie there in my bed and, you know, he'd just lie next to me. He was just stroking my hair a little bit. Like, this is a fully grown man, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old lads. Um, but they just knew I needed to sleep, you know. And so there were some good people around me that were trying to say, Rob, you, you're going too dark now. You've gone too far into it. And then obviously the, the crack, when I got onto the crack, that I lost loads of weight. I wasn't training anymore. I had no motivation People, my mates that I thought were mates would come around threatening to take me dad's ornaments that he left me, Toby jugs and all that, Royal Dalton Toby jugs because I owed them 50 quid from last night. And I just started to lose these mates, lose their respect, lose respect for myself, definitely. Did you lose your tough guy reputation as well? Um, I think people were always of that mindset, we're not going to push that because he could just revolt back, he could just turn. But I'd be walking through a field at night um, going to get a going to get a 20 stone or something out of crack and I'd be like literally like a nervous wreck like if a, if a, if a kid had jumped out from behind the tree I probably would have froze because I was I was in that mo I was living in this dark fear it was a fear that was almost tangible I don't know why the drugs affected me the way that they did because a lot of my mates would just be still doing it and they'd be going crazy on crack they'd want to fight everyone on that I was terrified I was living in like panic um unless I was unless I'd got the balance of the booze and the drugs right Mm. It was when I only had enough money for crack, not beer. If I took Coke or crack with beer at the same time, I would sort of stay in that place of aggression. And but the More balanced. The, more balanced. But the Coke on its own, the crack on its own, I would just become like this real sort of, you know, someone's coming to get me, the police are coming to get me. I, I, I used to have, I'd be wearing jeans and the seam of my jean I'd think was a wire. I'd start feeling it and I'd get a knife and I'd start cutting it and, you know, obviously cutting myself without meaning so I'm trying to get this wire off me thinking that they're bugged I'm, I'm feeling this this movement in my arm and I think there's somehow they've got an implant in me when I was asleep the other night and, and, I'm, and I'm following it and it's moving and, the, and it gets to the back of my head and I remember ringing up this ex-girlfriend who was studying psychology at the time and she came round and, and I'd been like this for about three hours just sitting on the sofa like trembling thinking if I move my finger, it's going to go into my brain and, and I'm going to die. And she was going, move your finger, Rob. It's fine. And she had to drive me around the estate for like two hours to the effects of the drugs started to wear off a bit mm. before I'd move my finger. But I'd been there like for five hours, terrified. If I move it, it's going to explode in my brain and I'm going to die. And, you know, it's, it's all that. So I was, I was living in that fear that my everything I'd done wrong, the guilt, the remorse, the shame I did feel, some nights I'd cry myself to sleep thinking of what I've just done to that guy and what, you know, how that's affected his family. And there was a there was a decency in me. There was some morals lurking in me, which I think was that formative time with my mum in the church and mm. hearing the Bible. So like, I just couldn't shake that, you know, and I would lie there, especially after my dad died, I'd lie there and just cry until I fell into a deep sleep. And I wouldn't wake up for two days and then I'd just get straight back on it because I didn't like the pain. I was in absolute torment for... for, for I mean, the, from 16 to 26, is, I got I became a Christian when I was 26. And for 10 years, it was drink, drugs, prison, violent sex, you know, pornography, just nightclubs, you know, Ibiza, Magaluf. You know, it was just it was just a nasty decade that I still have consequences of today. I think in my mental health and in my you know in some of my my personality stuff that I don't like about me that I'm looking at going. Do you know, I, I want to change that. I, I don't want my wife to to have this husband who's unstable mentally. I don't want my children to grow up around a, a dad that's a bit unstable. You know, I want them to have the best of the very best, which is why I'm on such a journey, a quest to just keep bettering myself. And so I've, I've gone to the doctors in Malawi. I live in Malawi, as you touched on earlier. And I went to St. John's of God, the mental health hospital. Um, I think it was a month or so ago, two months ago. And they, they diagnosed me with PTSD and severe depression. But I'm like, I don't think I am depressed. I'm depressed situationally. If something's not right in my family, if something's not right, you know, I, or someone says something or brings up, drags up the past. You feel it. I feel the pain of it. And I know I've got to let go of that because I've got to go, no, do you know what? They might not forgive me, but I am forgiven. God's forgiven me. Uh, that's not who I am anymore. There's remorse and, and shame there. And 
Uh, but I, I, it's like I'm desperate for them to forgive me, even though, you know, I've got to forgive myself and move on. Sometimes people just won't forgive you for stuff. They just won't. But I, I kind of live in that tension of the past and the new life, desperate to make amends everywhere I possibly can. Uh, and sometimes it's just not achievable. So I'm even on this journey now with a mentor of mine. And he's like, Rob, enough's enough. You've got to stop worrying about what they think of you. If they don't forgive you, they don't forgive you. That's between them and God. You've got to just forgive you and move on with your life. And so there's a lot of PTSD there that, that can trigger, um, you know, moments of, of upset and depression. Like yesterday was, a, yesterday was a hell, a day of hell. It's like I felt I was having a bath and I felt like someone was sitting on my chest. Like the weight, almost a physical pain of the emo depression, emotion, like just feeling empty, just feeling low. You knew you was coming here today, didn't I you? I knew I was coming here today. I knew I was going to be reliving a lot of stuff as well. So that I knew that because that always plays a part with, with an mm. interview. And afterwards as well, I have to. I have to after the interviews, I have to go right, have a bit of prayer, um, make sure I go to the gym or something. Counsel yourself. Counsel myself a little bit, and maybe you know, allow someone else to to speak into it a little bit and say, "Hey, I just did an interview, and I've just talked about stuff for my children. I've brought my dad up again." You know, and I brought up victims of my crimes again. And, you know, uh, yeah, I feel it. And I, I don't think, I think that if we've done wrong like that, we should feel it a bit. Because if we don't, we'd all become sociopaths. I mean, the thing is, <laughs> you are extremely, you're not here glamorising or glorifying anything. Oh, you Absolutely are, you're, not. You're extremely remorseful for the bad you've done, aren't you? 100%. If I could change it, I would I would do anything to change it. You and ma a massive respect for that as well. Because yeah, I, I know that you, I can see it, that you yeah. absolutely mean it yeah I do I, I weep sometimes you know I was determined I wasn't going to on the interview because I saw some of the previous interviews you've done I thought I can't be I can't be the one crying on the podcast no I I, I cry like, and I'm not afraid to me my dad always told me crying was weak you know he'd scream at me if I cried and now I'm like if I if I cry I'll even let my kids see me cry I'll ring my, my 18 year old boy up if I'm hurting and I'll you know he's, he's, a, he's an adult now so I'm like son I ain't got many people around me mm. I've got a very small inner circle um, and I need to be able to share this stuff with some people sometimes. And, you know, I don't want you to think it's weak. You I, know? I cry, mate. Yeah. I cry regularly. It's yeah. over It's over the same thing. Yeah. It's over the, the death yeah. of my nan. Yeah. 14 years. If I feel like I'm going to cry, yeah. I do not try and prevent it oh, or stop good. it. Otherwise, that just leads to It makes more, it worse. You become angry. Yeah. Because it's sort yeah. of... It's acceptable for women to cry yeah. because women are fragile, precious creatures and yeah. our job to look after yeah. them. So sort of the man shouldn't show weakness, yeah. but I would say to anyone watching this, men especially that Amen. are struggling, my DMs are flooded with men struggling. Yeah, I and I say, we all struggle, including me. Yeah. Th these are the little tricks you play with your mind to yeah. strengthen it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a bit like eating something you don't like that's good for you. Yeah. You've got to pretend it tastes nice. Yeah, yeah. That's Eventu good. That's a good analogy. Eventually yeah. it will. You and need it, so eat it even if you don't like the taste of it. And if I yeah. see a friend of mine, like, mm. just about to cry, but he's trying to fight it, I, I, it hold, out, I hold it down. I say, man, sure, mate, go for it. Don't yeah. fight that. Yeah, yeah. This is real and you, yeah. need, and you and, need to do and, it. And it's in a moment like that, it's guys like you saying that to these guys, that's going to stop a suicide one day. Or probably already has. Without a doubt. That's going to stop somebody throwing themselves off a bridge. That's going to stop somebody losing it in a pub because they can't take the pain that they're feeling it and smashing someone's head in and going to jail for life, spending the rest of his life in jail because he found someone that he could cry with mm. and, was, and wasn't was going to get belittled or mocked, but was going to get, mate, I love you. Um, I respect. I always tell people that cry in front of me, especially guys, I always say, do you know what? I don't respect you less. I actually respect you more now. Same. Make them feel like that's normalise emotions you know because guys like us we are emotional beings and that it, all my life I was mocked for it from my dad if he saw me crying he'd be like are you effing crying and so I'd you know I'd have to not cry but then it was just in me too I'm an emotional man mm. so I'll see your messages on your your Instagram your inspirational stuff you're running you you encourage people get about the day start early and we need more voices like that I want to be the person I needed. Yeah, that's exactly it. Someone once spoke to me at a church and he said, you're going to be the father to your kids that you never had. Mm. And I just broke down and cried. I mean, I was on the platform, as they said, it in a church of 2,000 people. And this guy just said it and I just broke in front of everybody um, because that it was just so accurate. Now, I can't, I'm not, I don't want anyone watching this to think, especially if a family member or so sees it, to think he's saying his dad was all bad. He put a work ethic in me. He put some qualities in me, protect women, protect, you know, he put, he put a work ethic in me, he put things in me that I think that, that are good qualities, but you can't give what you haven't got. And he didn't have a dad tell him, I love you, son, or affirm him, as far as I know. His dad died when he was very young. And so you can't give it if you haven't got it. 
You could, I could want to lend you a thousand pound if you needed a thousand pound all I want. But if I haven't got a thousand pound in my bank, I can want to do it, but I can't give it to you. Mm. I just can't give it to you. But if I've got a bank account and I like, I look at that as like a bank account of experience of, of past hurts, of, of lessons learned, of knowledge. mistakes made, knowledge that's come out of, I wish I'd have got it a different way, but I, I got it the hard way, but I've got it. And now you need it and it's in my account. So I can actually transfer that to your account if you want that. Beautiful. And there's and there's no there's no interest on that. There's no I'm giving you this because I want you to give me something back. This is a free gift. And I I do relate that kind of mindset personally, religiously, to the gospel. Well, what I see what Jesus, you know, people don't want to hear all this stuff, but what I see Jesus is like, I think if people really knew what Jesus was like, no one would be religious. I mean, people say to me, Are you religious? I'm like, no, I hate religion. I think religion's one of the biggest killers and war, you know, war starters there is. What I have is not religion. I have a relationship with this God, this example of a man who came to lay down his life and would help the prostitutes and the drug addicts and the tax collectors and the ones that were the most vile and, and hated. He came to love them. He came to love the sick, not the healthy, you know? So I like, I like it when people come to me and they're honest. And that interview I did that you saw the other day, I got not, not flooded with DMs, but I got a lot of messages from people from churches, from businesses, from, you know, CEOs. My, my marriage is in tatters because of porn. I, I feel like su committing suicide because I've got addicted to porn. And I'm like, if I hadn't shared that, that guy might have killed himself. But I just say, I was just able to give him a word of hope there and say, well done for reaching out. You're not alone. You're loved. And hopefully now he's not going to throw himself off a bridge. Well, on the subject of, of porn addiction, mm. can you describe your porn addiction mm. so that someone that's going through the same thing that doesn't realise they've got an issue with it or it's actually destroying their relationships, yeah, yeah. So they can identify yeah. with it. I mean, I'm not a porn addict anymore, which is one of the things that I did um, email Lad Bible and others. BBC Free did an, an interview with me which had 2.7 million views, load a load of people messaging me on that one. Um, that's still on YouTube. Um, I, I, I got upset with them when they labelled it me porn addict. Because mm. for me, I take seriously, if someone says to me, you're an addict... Because people in the world, especially with the 12-step programs and all that, they're out there, they say, my name is and I'm, I am an alcoholic. But well, you haven't had a drink for 20 years. I don't think you're an alcoholic anymore. That's exactly how yeah. I think. Yeah. And I think that that's so important. Um, I, I don't know what r m reason you relate like that and why we agree so much on it. For me, it's because there's a verse in the Bible that says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So if I keep saying I'm an addict, I'm an addict, I'm an addict, I'm just staying a prisoner of, of addiction in my own heart and my own life. So I, I am an ex-addict. I'm an ex-cocaine addict. I'm an ex-porn addict. I'm an ex-crack addict. Um, and even when there were times where I failed in one of those, it wasn't the same as when I was an addict. It was just a momentary lapse. It was a painful um, escapism moment or something stupid. You just fell off the wagon. Fell off the wagon for a week or two, whatever it was. But I don't turn to porn anymore. Now, of course, I've got a high sex drive. I still don't turn to porn anymore. I've got a grip on that. It doesn't mean that over the 18 years of me being a Christian that there weren't times when I really fell into it because I really did. Even sex messaging, you know, if I wasn't being intimate with my wife and um, for whatever reason, a baby coming along or just hormones or tiredness or whatever, I, I didn't have a grip. On, I didn't have any control. I, there, there was no self-control. And as as same as you've done, I had to go on a real self-discovery journey. Why can't I control that? Why, you know, obviously we are wired for sex. We are sexual beings. And, you know, we're not supposed to go long without sex. Um, but within the marriage, I, I think within a marriage, people, you know, might think I'm being a bit overly religious here. But for me, that perfect picture is a married couple that are in love, that are procreating, that are having children, that are raised in a home that's full of love, care, support, provision, all those things. Um, good, good inf influences in the father figure, good influence from the mother figure. That's going to build a village. That's going to build a healthy community. But when it becomes perverted, when it, like you say, there's times when my wife might have wanted sex, but because she didn't last week or so and I just whacked a load of porn on, I'm not actually right now in the mood because I've just had a steak and I don't want another steak right now. You know, you, you, might, you might love steak and your wife might offer you a steak using that picture, but you've just had a, two hours of steak in a bedroom on your own with your, with your mobile phone. You, you're, 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 you're full up. You know, you can't, you can't do it. Or when you do do it, your brain is just remembering that scene. And that I feel like that dishonours the woman even more. It's like you're cheating on her. And also pornography becomes more, yeah. more stimulating than course, the real thing. Yeah, it does. And you need something extra because that becomes not enough. So then she feels she's not enough. 
or, or he, you know, whatever the, the, the situation is. And so I know that the porn addiction, I'd say out of all of the drugs I've ever been addicted to, amphetamine, speed, um, alcohol, cocaine, crack, pornography. I would say that the probably the one that's caused more damage than any would be the pornography, by far. Um, you know, different kind of pain, different, like the, the cocaine might have made me more violent. And so I was, that had an impact on the guy. But he healed from that broken nose. He healed from that, you know, that head wound or whatever. But that that wound to a wife, that wound to a church or to a community or someone that, that looked up to you as an inspirational figure or something, and then they found out, oh, he's, he's been watching porn or he's been messaging another woman, that, that can shatter especially a young man that's looking up to you as a, you know, you're online, you've got a podcast, you've got a good business, you externally, everything looks great. They see Instagram, it, it promotes the best stuff, doesn't it? We don't really put our junk on there. We put our, our successes on there. Mm. Um, I try to balance it. I try to put a bit of both on, but... I, I try and do it. And also, yeah. like these long format interviews, yeah. mm. if I can relate to someone I'm talking to yeah. through, through the mistakes I've made, yeah. I'm not just going to sit there and nod and just yeah. let you keep going. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to let you know... I relate to that. I relate to that yeah. because I've been there. And, and you know what that I, does for me? That. that gives me that gives me some healing. Because mm. what what I think happens, especially with porn, it's mo it, like you say, it's in secret. Mates will sniff cocaine in a in a room of twenty people together, but some do. But probably most men out there, or most people out there, wouldn't go. All right, there's twenty of us. Let's whack some porn on and all just get our willies out, mm. like because that that's that's normally like after the night's ended and you've gone off on your on your own. Because there is something about it that we understand is is not right. It's just not, it's weird. And often if men, I think, are honest with themselves, the moment that they've ejaculated to porn, they feel an emptiness. They feel more empty than before they started it. They, they massively. massively. And you know when, you, when you're up and you're, and you're out your nut mm. and you're watching porn and you're watching it for hours. Mm. and you're, Binging. You're edging. Yeah. You're, mass, you're, you're, you're edging, you're watching the porn, yeah, yeah. you're out your nut, you're sniffing the gear, yeah. you're edging to it, and then... Go back to another line or yeah, another, another beer. And, and then you start from scratch again, yeah, yeah. oh, look, it's gone down again. Yeah, yeah. Here I am shaking a limp dick on my own. What a sad act. Yeah. But when you finally come to completion, because eventually mm. you always do, you sit there and, and you, you feel, feel... empty. You feel lonely yeah. and empty. Ashamed and you, even. You do feel ashamed. You yeah. feel ashamed, dirty, you feel weak, yeah. and you think... Why did I just yeah. do that? Yeah. And this is when you know you've got a problem because once yeah. you've felt all those horrible, lonely, disappointed feelings yeah. about yourself, yeah. within the next hour, you start the process yeah, again. again. Because it's, it's that circle, it's that vicious circle, isn't it? It's like emptiness, escape, masturbate or coke or whatever. Some it's food. You're talking about people that, you know, open the fridge at three in the morning to have another cream cake because they mm. just can't say no to the grub and they're obese. It all for me tiles down. When people come to me now with any form of addiction, and they always say, I've got a problem with alcohol. Or, I've got a problem with Coke. I say the Coke's not the problem and the alcohol's not the problem. That's the fruit that's growing on the tree. Let's forget the fruit. Forget that for now. Forget the fact that you're sticking a line of cocaine up your nose every half hour. What's driven you to that? What's called Because if you don't deal with the root, the fruit will just keep coming back. Mm. It will come back again and again, and it's that soul wound. It's that childhood wound it's that fatherhood it's that nan dying it's that 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 big person in your life that that has died and is no longer there and you that that hole that you're left with and which i've got to feel that oh something you know and f for some it's one thing for some it's another and what we've got to stop doing in my opinion is judging each other's escapism um go-to's yours might be different to mine people watching this podcast they'll be like oh i've never watched porn I'm like, yeah, but you're smoking 20 fags a day or whatever because you can't, you're so nervous, you can't mm. sit still. Or, or you're just scrolling Instagram for hours, wasting time that you could be out there doing some good with your life, building a business, being more present with your children, taking your kids to the park or to the cinema or swimming. And it's like, what is it that we're all escaping from? What are we lacking? What are we missing? And for me, I really believe that that was the fact that I was created to have a relationship with an, a non-religious God. A relational God. That's what I believe. That for me. And then even then, I, when I had that, and I have that now, sometimes that's still not enough, even though I know it is. It's just we, we're, we're led to believe from media, from people's opinions and all that, that you've got to try that. Like it was my best mate at the time that convinced me to take speed. I was the biggest drug hater in the town. Mm. I used to go up to snooker club playing snooker. If I knew someone was on drugs, I'd follow them in the toilet. And I'd, I'd, I'd have me snooker cue and I'd put it up against their neck. 
And I'm like, because I could see that they were playing different and they were talking different and all that. And someone said, he just had a line of coke in the toilet. And I thought that was your cheat. You're cheating. We're in a snooker competition. You're cheating. You're che not knowing that actually it's probably going to make him play a lot worse because he's flipping. <laughs> They'll so, think they're playing yeah, better. Yeah, exactly. It's not like a, it's a, an enhancement drug. It's a, you know. But for me, it was a, you're a, if you take a drug, you're a cheat. You're dirty. And I spent, because I, my sister had been a drug abuser and she'd been beaten by boyfriends and they'd done horrible things. So they bullied me when they came around the house. And, you know, I went on a rampage when I became old enough to go and get all of our ex-boyfriends back and beat them all up and... You know, so I started off hating drugs, but it was a, a friend that's got a big influence in my life. Still a good friend now. Um, known each other since we were three or four years of age. And he was taking speed. And because he said, Rob, everyone says it's dirty, but trust me, I'm your mate. Who are you going to believe? The opinion of, not, you know, people you don't know or your best buddy that you trust. So we don't realise the kind of influence that we have on each other that can actually turn our whole lives mm. by one selfish moment because you don't want to sniff on your own or you don't want to pop a pill on your own. You want your mate to do it with you. And you've just taken him on that path with you that for some they never get off of it. I've buried friends. I've had friends and family commit suicide, you know, and get the phone call at two in the morning or whatever, so-and-so's just died. What? And you, you're broken. And then... I always, my mate, his dad died and and I know his dad and his relationship was so bad because of his drug habit. I'm like, what, what are you going to do now your dad's just died? Are you going to go and honour him by getting high on coke, the very thing that broke your relationship up in the first place? Yeah, you probably are. You're going to escape from the reality of it. And that's what drugs for me are. Any form of drug, pornography, the, the, the overeating of food or whatever it might be, sex, porn, speak. It's an escape and we've got to get to the root of the problem. And not just keep exposing the fruits in everyone's lives and the bad fruit, the good fruit, exposing, exposing, exposing. What's what? Why is that guy doing that? What? So if someone comes to me, I'm like, why? Are you, why are you doing that? Why did you have an affair? What's really going on in your marriage, or what's what's going on in your your upbringing? Let's get to the root of the issue. And I think if we do that and do that well, and we do media on this, and we start to flood the media with a, with stuff that's honest and real, which is why I love this podcast so much. In the last week or so, I've had to just go through as much as I can of what you're doing. I'm telling everyone, I'm like, oh, finally, there's someone that's actually, and to hear that you've been censored a couple of times, so that I'm like, oh, it's, just, it's just bloody typical, isn't it? Mm. People that want to be honest and real would admit shame, admit sin, admit admit mistakes, then they get censored. I love telling people yeah. my mistakes. Yeah. You know when you say Instagram, you're just putting your best foot forward? Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I put my best content forward yeah. because I, I genuinely want to help yeah. people. I want to lift their spirits, raise the yeah. bar for them, give yeah. them something to, to grip hold of and yeah. run with. Yeah. But in the same breath, like these long format interviews, yeah. if I can relate, I love yeah. exposing myself yeah. for all the things I've done that were wrong and my weaknesses and my yeah. flaws because then it's like, hey, I'm a, yeah. I'm a human being. Yeah, so definitely. I was going to ask you, how old were you when you first started watching porn? Ooh. I was exposed to porn at the age of four. I was, a, I was a kid and I was taken into a house of people that were watching porn and it was bestiality porn. I remember it was a v movie, a VHS or even a Betamax, if I remember rightly, um, going around of, of um, it's called Animal Farm. I was going to say, we're the same age, it's got to be Animal Farm. Yeah, yeah, Animal Farm. And that was like, that was going around and women with horses and pigs and cats, you know, all that, like real evil, evil stuff. And they had it on, they'd found the tape under the dad's bed probably. Um, and so I was just in the background playing, but they were all, watching it and masturbating to it and all that. And I was exposed to that at a very, very young age. I mean, and that's another level. That's a whole other level of, of degradation of the heart and mind. Um, and then I was even put into bed when I was a couple of years older with the, the sister of this family. There was like mostly brothers, but there was one, there was two or three sisters, a big family uh, that lived on the same estate. And they got me into bed with one of them and they were like all standing round the older kids, and they were like, right, you do that, what, what you just saw on the field, like you do that to him and you, you do that to her. And we didn't, we were fumbling because mm. we didn't we didn't want to be there. And I remember the fear, the shame. Nervousness. Older, big men standing over me telling me to do this and I'm a child. And, you know, there was some abuse there. You know, I, I, I didn't accept that until a few years ago that that was actually a form of sexual abuse. And your whole mind, your whole psyche, your whole character becomes stained and twisted sexually, morally, all those things. You look at women differently. I don't care what anyone says. When you, when you watch porn, you do look at women differently. You know, we do. And that carries on into adulthood and that carries on in, in, into the loving relationship that you now want. And you, you wonder why, why you're not present. You're not, you're not committed. You're not faithful. 
you're you're dragged away by the impulses and the urges of your lust. And through that, I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying that that means it was okay. But through that, I was unfaithful. They called it online adultery to my, about my wife because I was messaging other women, pornography nonstop. And that hurt her and, and obviously still hurts her. And that breaks me because she, I love her. And you have, to, you have to accept that and you've got to try and clean that mess up and it's not an overnight thing. And, and then you get the, the, the finger waggers and I, I'm, I'm convinced that if not all of the big finger waggers are the ones that are actually secretly just as addicted to the same thing. Um, and they feel guilty about themselves. They want to project that on someone else because they haven't got the humility. Those who shout the loudest. Exactly. They haven't got the guts, the courage to actually go, do you know what? Yeah, I was also a sexual pervert. I was also sexually twisted. Um, yeah, I've also messed up. I've also flirted down the gym with another woman that's not my wife. I've I've looked at her. Oh, I actually went further and I texted her. But you were you were texting her with those eyes just then in the gym. You were flirting with her. You were telling her what, what you think about her. And you might not have gone as far as texting her. But, you know, where's the line, guys? You know, so I think we're all a bit twisted sexually. I think we're all a bit twisted morally. We've all got good sides, bad sides, good, good characteristics, bad characteristics. But there's guys out there that look at themselves and go, do you know what? I want to be better. And those are the ones that I think I want to offer my help to the most. Not the, not the healed and the perfect, but the broken and the hurting. I want to give my life now to the poor, to the marginalized, to the hurting, to the broken. And if I can help one, awesome. If I can help a thousand, come on. If I can, if I can be an influence in many others, then he, all the better, you know. And, and to do that, we've got to be vulnerable like this. I, I totally agree. And just to, just to box off the porn thing before, because mm. I want to go, I want to, I want to find out how yeah. you found God, mm. and then I want to talk about what you're doing in Malawi. Yeah, to, to, to close it off. But before we get there, just to box off the whole porn thing, yeah. the connection between being exposed to pornography. From a young age, because yeah. I was watching it very, very young, because my dad exposed me to yeah. pornography when yeah. I was maybe eight. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder, this is the thing. Now, I think this is a, probably a good thing mm. because, so I'm an 80s, 80s mm. child. Yeah. So it was 80s porn mm. that I'd be exposed mm. to. And that was normally one man, one, one woman. woman. Pubic hair, yeah, yeah, and they the actually, whole story uh, build up. Yeah, to it. the plumber walks in, yeah. and there's a connection. There's somebody at the door. Yeah, <laughs> but, but they, but the, the, yeah. they looked like they was enjoying it, and yeah. they actually looked like they was in love. Yeah, a yeah. lot, a lot of yeah. time. So, luckily for me, I think luckily, yeah. that's what does it for me, mm. making love. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm about as normal as it gets in the mm. bedroom. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to, I, I, I want to make love. Yeah. I'm not into all this, like the, the modern day porn. So yeah. when you're flicking through all these porn sites yeah. and there's all these different genres and madness yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. blokes hung like that. Yeah. And you can tell it's staged yeah, and the woman yeah. isn't enjoying it. And she's probably drugged up and all yeah. that as well. I can't relate yeah. to that. So I've never watched any funky porn in yeah. my life. It's yeah. always been retro yeah. 80s classics yeah. where the two people look like they're, they're in love themselves. when they're yeah. doing it. And I think... I've but always, you still recognise that that alone is wrong. Just watching, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's it's two people. Yeah, it's two other. It's, it's their business. Not yeah. I'm not in love with them, yeah. and they're not in love with me. Yeah, yeah. That's got nothing to do with me. Yeah. Oh, I'm well aware it's completely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's off the scale and, it, and yeah. it's not normal, which yeah. is why I haven't watched porn for yeah. years and yeah. years. By the way, yeah. And uh, anyone that's struggling at home with their relationships, like mm. number one, stop watching porn. That's the first and thing. And don't pretend that you that you don't watch it because mm. you do. Yeah. Everybody, Definitely. I don't know anybody yeah. apart from a, a, a few that overdone it. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, a lot of people don't recognise it's a problem. Yeah, you, and and you're like, and if it's not a problem, why are you mm. pretending you don't watch it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly it. If if it wasn't a problem, you'd be happy to tell your nan it. You'd be happy yeah. to tell your mum it. You know, because it's, because it's normal. Everyone's doing it. So why aren't you telling your mum and dad? Why aren't you telling your nan and granddad? Yeah. You know. So yeah, I, I agree with you. The, when you said that, because that's what I was raised. I'm, I was born in '79, and the porn then was videos or magazines, but. When it was videos, it was it was like normally a woman waiting in for the plumber to come round or the mm. window cleaner, and the storyline was a bit of a build up to it and all of that, and then they and then you just watch them have sex. Now it's internet and it is two minute clips, three minute clips. It's like a feast of you know, and it's it is some of it's it caters for every perversion, it caters for every kind of fantasy, it caters for every kind of you know whatever you want to call it, like the mindset, the brokenness, and it gets darker and darker and darker. You know, and the pop-ups and all those sort of things. Now, I've never been into any of the illegal porn. I've never been in, in the, and I, I don't get that, which is why I'm a big advocate what we do in Malawi, rescuing young girls that are underage and all that. For me, there's the line. But for some, that, that line sadly does become very, very blurry for a lot of people. And it can be a slower fade 
And I'm not saying that people that are watching this are going into flipping paedophilia and all that sort of stuff, but the porn, the, the girls are getting younger and younger and younger in it. And the interviews that I'm seeing from ex porn stars, whatever, that are now in church or something like that. And they're like, what age did you start performing? And they were like 15. And I'm like, you know, there's probably guys watching this that don't realize that they've just watched and masturbated to a 15 year old girl because it's, it's 21 on the, on the, on the link or whatever. But the girls are getting younger and younger and it's all drug induced. Um, there's ex porn stars that I follow that have become Christians and are now, you know, advocating against pornography and hearing the stories that they say I've wept and wept and wept because, you know, they were like, Oh, I, I let everybody think that I was enjoying it because I was an actress. Mm. I, I led them to believe that that was a real orgasm. I was having, and I was fully enjoying myself, but really off camera, there was a needle with heroin in it that they just pumped into me or whatever drug pill they made me take. And there's puke in the corner from my last, when I just had the last scene and I felt so ashamed, I puked in the corner and I haven't cleaned it up yet and I've got to do another scene. And you start hearing these stories and it's like, oh, it wrenches on your heart. It really is a hard hitting truth. That, but then you do get some that I've, in, I've heard interview. Oh, I love it. I do it because I love it. And I wouldn't stop it even if they gave me all the money in the world because I love sex. I'm like, well, there's still a problem there. Like you, you, you are, that's, an, that's become an addiction to you for whatever reason on the scale, loving it or pretending to love it. There's a problem when you're wanting to show the world your body and your bits and pieces and have men jerk off to you or whatever. So I do think that pornography is, in its entirety, I would say it's wicked personally, but I don't say that to shame anyone watching or addicted. I say that to say like, realize what it is and then reach out for help. And when someone reaches out for help, if you're not someone that's been into porn, don't judge them. Don't shame them just because you never did that. Because we need to become unshockable. You need to be able to tell me your darkest secrets in a place of confidence and me not go <gasps> and put a face that makes you feel immediately more ashamed, mm. which is what I said to my wife. Do you know what I love about this, Liam? I saw the, one of the last interviews you did and the guy was confessing some dark, dark stuff. But when I, when the camera was new, I was like, his face isn't shot. He's not like stunned. Um, he's not making the guy feel ashamed or anything like that. He's not agreeing with it. The, the bio's not in any way promoting it and saying, look, guys, this is another option for your life. You could become like this guy. But, you know, you were unshockable. And that for me, now I've, I've only met you and, properly today we've had a good few chats on the phone and voice notes and whatnot but i feel like now i'd be like you know what? if i'm having a really bad day if i'm struggling i reckon i could probably just fire off a little texty and say mate i'm i'm feeling low i'm feeling really depressed and i'll probably get an instant message back hey brother do you need a chat that's how we need to be with each other not I, agreeing I, with it thought, not glamorizing it exactly in any way not not promoting it Telling us, telling that okay, mate, that's wrong. You got to stop that. You can't go around killing people. <laughs> you can't. Go, you can't keep cheating on your wife. You can't keep beating people up down the pub. But I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to help you if if you want help. Here I am, which is what I love about the content you're putting out. I've always had no problem with the tough conversations, mm. and I've had no problem disagreeing with people. Yeah. But it comes from a place of love. love. Yeah. Nothing will shock me because I've seen it all. Yeah. So that's why yeah. I'm probably a good soundboard yeah, for yeah. people, and yeah. I'm I'm all ears. Yeah. I understand. And normally, if somebody is confessing something yeah. it's because they want to change it's the person that keeps the stuff a secret yeah. that i don't trust mm. and i'd i'd be very cautious as to as to, as to lend them my yeah, yeah. ears because yeah, if yeah. you lend someone your ears you're lending them your heart and your yeah, soul you yeah. you're letting them in what we're looking for is connection that they, they say that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety the opposite of addiction is connection because you feel disconnected in some way from something or someone and so we're trying to find that in something else. So for me, whenever I was watching porn, it was because actually what I was craving was a, a regular, consistent, intimate, loving sexual relationship with my wife or at the time a girlfriend. Um, but I never had that. And the influence, I mean, I found a, a, a recording that my dad did while he was alive. I was obviously on the camera, like, a, you know, an old camcorder thing. Um, and my cousin gave it to me and I was watching it with my now wife a few years ago this is, at her home, and we put it on and we're watching it. And she's laughing at a lot of it, and I'm feeling really emotional. And there was one thing that my dad said that my wife laughed at, because it was kind of an off-the-cuff comment, but I burst into tears. And she kind of looked at me, she went, what's wrong? I said, did you just hear what he said? Because I don't remember him saying it, but then I was just a kid. And what it was is I'm video, I must have been eight, nine, ten, something like that. My cousin's girlfriend um, comes through the door while I'm recording in the kitchen. It's at Christmas. 
And my dad's sitting there because like, he's in the camera. Um, and then my cousin's there. He's a few years older than me. But then his girlfriend comes around. So I keep the camera rolling. And as she walks into the kitchen just to say hi, my dad goes, oh, um, I won't say her name just in case, you know, oh, um, my son's got the camera out. Why don't you get the clothes off? Uh, and, and everyone laughed and she laughed. She's only like 20 something, 21, maybe young. Um, my dad's in his forties, whatever at the time, 50 something. Cause he, he had me when he was quite late. Um, and I just, my, my wife laughed cause it was just an off the cuff joke. But for me, I just wept and I said, so she went, what's wrong? I said, what hope did I have? When from the youngest memories and age, everyone was sexualized and it was actually a bit perverted to ask a young woman walking through the door to take her clothes off, even if it was a joke. Mm. Like for me, it actually hurt me. And I was like, if that was my daughter, you know? So then you feel the guilt and the shame because you are addicted to porn or you are doing those things. And you know that if that was your daughter, you'd be you'd be responding very differently to someone saying it's okay to watch porn. Mm. If your daughter was performing like that and there was a group of men with their willies out masturbating over your daughter... Because you, you'd be weigh, you'd be weighing them in because it's your daughter. One hundred percent, wouldn't you? Oh yes. And so that's how I like to look at it, and that's one of the things that keeps me in a moment of wanting to. Is like I try and, you know, whether it's right or wrong, I try and think what if that was, and also then, but when I have before, what damage that did to my marriage, to my sex life, to my own character, to my own mind. Porn brings in depression. Porn brings in a lot of mental health issues. It brings in stress, anxiety. Always because it's it's offering you something that it can't actually give you, so it's you still empty afterwards, as we said. Mm. I think we've got to we've got to talk more about these topics, and we've got to be real and honest about it, and not shame people when they come forward. We've got to create an environment where people can go. Do you know what? I feel I could go to Liam or Rob, or I could go to my church leader, I could go to my wife, or my, and I could say because it's not just a man thing anymore. I, I was getting loads of women messaging after reading my book and I, I had it. to point them towards my wife and my mother-in-law because I was like, obviously I don't want to reply to that because I'm going to end up probably getting a bit too yeah. involved. So you have an inappropriate, inappropriate conversation. Yeah, because it's... when you've got a lust issue and there's someone else of the opposite sex and you're attracted to the opposite sex and they're saying that they've got a lust issue, it ain't going to go well. It's, you know, you might want to help, but it's going to end up... Mm. Uh, and that did for me happen a lot of times, you know, with people reaching out saying, I've got a problem with my sex life and my husband. And then this is one of the things that really hurt me because I was a church pastor, obviously you're in a position of authority. So I suppose if you're a police officer or if you're a football coach or whatever, you're seen as someone that's in authority. So then someone, and never underage, but like someone then, you know, maybe come up to me and saying, oh, can you pray for me? My husband's not giving me any sex and I'm horny all the time, you know, and you're struggling with those same things. But then afterwards, they maybe if it comes out, then they say you took advantage of a vulnerable woman oh, she's 25 she's 30 or however you know she's a fully grown woman yeah but her dad died last year well i didn't bloody know that did i and like how how's that me abusing her as a vulnerable adult mm. but so we're all and that's what i always say we're all vulnerable mm. but the person that's in authority that yeah you're if you're in authority you've got to know a bit better you've got to have a little bit more about you you've got to be a bit more self-controlled i get that totally but it's then them words that men won't come forward because they feel they're going to get labeled they're going to get shamed. So they internalize it. They hide it like I did for so long. And then when I did finally tell someone I'm struggling and they went to someone who went to someone and all of a sudden they started looking at my emails. They could see that I've been watching porn sites while I was preparing sermons in the church office and, you know, stuff that I deeply, deeply regret. Um, I've written a book about it. I've written, I've preached about it. I've shared it with Channel 4, BBC3. You know, I've been, I've put myself and my soul out there. Hmm. And sadly, you still get people that will just try to keep that wound open and just stick that knife in a bit deeper rather than going, do you know what? I'm going to forgive him because he's he's actually confessing it and he's trying. And then and then they heal and you heal and then people become whole, you know? Being a porn addict mm. is like an alcoholic living in a pub because wow. we all have access to the internet there and there yeah. it is. And sex sells. Yeah, even, it's even it's even slipped in yeah. in the most innocent yeah. format. Yeah, in uh, advertisements. Yeah, there'll be a lady in a bikini. Yeah, because it stimulates the man's it mind and it gets it him feeling yeah fruity. Yeah, I've not spoke about porn for years because yeah. I've not watched porn for yeah, years, yeah. and it's something I've never really aired to anybody yeah. because it's yeah. something I just done on my own. Yeah, and uh, talking about it has reminded me that. Stay it's, away from it. it's empty, it's lonely, yeah. it's sad, it's Come depressing, on. it's dark. Yeah. 
and it's just reminding me why I stopped yeah. watching it years ago. Yeah, and yeah. that's so, that's why because I've been advised to stop sharing my sort of that because obviously I have to also understand that when when I do these interviews, my wife watches them, mm. and obviously for her, there's a hurt on a different scale because she's felt betrayed. And, and rightly so, you know, because it is. You're looking and, and getting sexual gratification from someone that's not your wife. Is it cheating? Yeah, I think it is. I do think it is. I think that although I don't like the way that they labelled me an online adulterer, they called it because it was pornography, it was online. Mm. Um, to a degree, I get that. I do understand that and I kind of agree with it. it is, it's a form of adultery. Now, obviously, someone might say, yeah, but my wife likes it. We watch it together, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole other, that's a whole other topic. There's a whole other subject because I suppose if she's aware of that and it's in agreement, I'm still not saying it's right at all. But would it then be classed as cheating if the if the person has knowledge and agreement? Mm. That's a different thing altogether, I'm, 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 I'm thinking. But nine out of ten times it is when the wife's asleep or when the wife's out, it's that quick on your phone. And you can even be out having a meal. Now, like back in the day, you, you wouldn't carry a magazine in your back pocket and go into the toilets. But now on the phone, you could be anywhere at any time and you can just go and have a feast. Mm. You know, and it is so readily available. I love what you've said about it's like asking an alcoholic to work as a barman. It's everywhere. And I'm so that's a powerful thing. And I, t I mean, I also, I mean, I'm into the whole gratitude mm. list, law of attraction. I write down things I'm grateful for. Yeah. And I'm very grateful that Paul never affected any of my relationships mm. because it's been it's been that many years. Yeah. So me, me, me and my partner have been together six and a half years. Yeah. So this predates her. Yeah, yeah. Paul was, is well, well and truly in the, in the rear yeah. view mirror. Yeah. But I can see how it will destroy, yeah. will destroy lives. It does. It really does. Well, I enjoyed sharing that with you. Yeah. And you know that I'm not religious. Mm. And although religion is not on my radar mm. and it's not important to me, I know that religion is important to you. Yeah, very and, much. And therefore now... Yeah. It's important to me. Yeah, which is a mutual respect thing. Yeah, yeah. so I, I now want to know yeah. how you found God. Yeah, so obviously you've heard my story, the drugs, the violence, the prison, all of that. Um, but that got me to the point of suicide, you know, really wanting to end my life. Um, the crack, you know, for three years I was on the crack. The last three years of my 10-year stint on drugs, it was, it was crack was the main thing. Um, so I would spend all day every day in my flat with the curtain shut or bed sit room, just a room. Curtains were shut. No one was allowed in or out. You know, I, it was just a darkness in that in that environment, and that was all I knew. I was alone. I was scared. I was kind of ejected by a lot of friends and family. Had to understand me, sort of distance themselves because of the way I'd behave if they were around me. I was aggressive. I was, you know, I, I wasn't a nice person. I was begging for money, borrowing money, lying, cheating, whatever I could to get money, um, stealing stuff. You know, I was whatever I could do to feed that crack habit. It was bad. Now. Um, I got to the point where I was um, with a girl. We were due to get married. She was pregnant with my son, my, my adult son, Callum. And she was so into like this particular Christmas and wanting to get the presents wrapped and all that for family. And I blew all the money on, on crack. Um, I was upstairs in the bedroom saying, don't come in. I'm just going to wrap your present up. I don't want you to say, I hadn't got her a present. I didn't have any money, you know, I'd gone off and I'd spent it on crack. And so I'm pretending I'm up there, I'm rustling um, wrapping paper, pretending I'm wrapping up a present I haven't got, just so she doesn't come in the room because I'm just sucking on this bloody pipe. Um, and I think it was the boxing day she had enough, rightly so, and understandably so, she could not stay with me um, as a crack addict. She's heavily pregnant with our now son Callum. And... Um, I, I then thought, I've got a son coming. I've got to do everything I can to get off the drugs. I've got to try now. Because before I didn't care. Well, I pretended I didn't care. But now I've got a, a baby boy coming into the world. And I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be able to say, I've got a son and he'll never see me high. He'll never see me drunk, whatever. Um, and I couldn't do it. I tried so many things. My sister took me to a psychologist. They gave me the pills, Zyprexa, Olanzapine, for people that hear things, see things, and imagine things that are not real. Um, Drug-induced psychosis. I'd lost so many friends. I lost relationships with so many people. I'd taken friends hostage at knife point. That you know, good good mates, and obviously that 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 does something to a relationship that can never be fully restored. Um, and I got very very depressed and very suicidal. I remember standing at a bridge that overlooked the A one down by North Hearts, three in the morning, whatever, looking at the lorries coming up the road and thinking, can I just throw myself in front of it and she can bring up this kid and people will be better off without me. 
you start to self-loathe, you start to really condemn yourself, you start to hate who you are. You can't look in the mirror, you can't look at yourself in the mirror, you've got no respect for yourself, and you're just carrying all this condemnation and shame. And um, I, I didn't throw myself off, there was a voice in my head that just kept pulling me away, and you know, I was like, oh, no, that would destroy them as well, either way they're, they're stuffed. And this went on for a good year or so of me living in this state of real depression, suicidal thoughts, condemnation, shame, all of that. And I, I remember being in my bed sit um, and I remember being on, on my knees with the pipe and there was a mirror that I think I'd had a bit of coke or something as well. So there was like residue of coke on there and there was my pipe with no crack to put in it because I'd run out. There was no one I could borrow from anymore. I'd exhausted every effort to get 20 quid to go to my dealer and get another stone. Porn magazines and stuff at the bottom of the bed. Everything that represented my life. The, the violence, weapons, so there was a knife in case anyone came round. And, uh, and I remember just thinking there's everything that represents me, sexual perversion, violence and addiction, you know, those three real things, loneliness, isolation, rejection. And I remember my mum had come round a week or two before and she'd brought another one of her God magazines and I'd thrown it at the bottom of the bed like the others and just didn't care. And I remember ringing my mum up and saying, Mum, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my life. Obviously, when you ring someone up to tell them, you're probably not nine out of ten times. But it was it's still, it still has real cry for help. People shouldn't dismiss people when they tell people or they say I'm suicidal because they might not be that, that moment. They might be on the edge, but they could be the next day or the next week. And then you don't get a phone call. You just get them hanging off the chandelier. Um, so I remember ringing my mum up. It was a cry for help. And so I said, Mum, I can't live like this. I'm so sorry. I've, I've hurt so many people. And I remember her saying, like, she was crying. She, I think she knew that I was on the edge. And she was crying and she was saying, please, son, there's a magazine at the bottom of your bed. And I shit myself because I thought, I wonder what magazine she's on about. Um, and I picked it up. I remember picking it up. And she said at the back, there's a prayer. There's a prayer you pray. And it just basically was like, God, forgive me. You know, I'm a sinner. That kind of, you know, it was just, we call it the sinner's prayer, but it's not actually in the Bible. It's just made up out of a few revelations. Admitting that you're a sinner, admitting that you've messed up asking God for help, inviting him into your life, giving him your life. So I just thought, I'll just, I'll just word it myself. You know, I'm not good at reading off a script. So I just thought, oh, and I, all I remember saying is, God, if you're real, God, if you're real, because I wasn't sure. Um, I've seen my, my mum's life turn. I've seen my sister's life's turn. I've seen and heard a lot of these testimonies that they share in churches. And, um, and I remember saying, Jesus, if you're real, could you save a man like me? Is that possible? And I didn't have an epiphany. I didn't have angels turn up and all of that were burning bush or, you know, any of these sort of experiences. But I remember going to sleep and sleeping with peace. For no paranoia, no delusions, no seeing out the curtains, people with guns and things, no, no cops in the trees. For the first time in a long time, I slept with peace. So I always say to people, what I, and, and I think God knew that what I needed more than anything was peace just this sense of peace in my life that I've been striving for years. And uh, I remember waking up the next morning with absolutely no desire to go and get a drug, none. And I remember walking out of my bedroom for the first time I'd been out. I, I Normally at three in the morning, I'd go out just to meet the guy in the corner to grab the stone and go back. I walked out during the day and it was a sunny day. And I remember looking up the sky and seeing all these colours and these clouds and the blues and the, 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 the sun. You could see the moon in the background and all that. And I remember just thinking... There's no way that's just happened. There's no way that's just happened in a bang. There's no way that that's just evolved. That's, you know, that's a creator. That's a creator. And it, for me, it was a real revelation. And then the, the biggest thing that happened is I used to look at men walking down the road when I was in my violent days. And I remember thinking if I, I, I remember thinking if I ran and hit him as hard as I could, could I lift him off the floor a little bit? Because I'd seen that in a Rocky movie, you know, he uppercuts and the guy comes off the, off, off his feet. Um, and I remember, I remember thinking, I wonder if I could do that. You know, and I looked at this guy and I remember just feeling this love for this complete stranger. I just wanted to love him. And like almost like having to hold myself back from running over and hugging this guy. And I thought, God, I, I said I'd give you my life. I didn't say you could turn me gay. You know, that was kind of like a little joke that I said to me, in my head. But I just felt love. And I, I went to the BP garage right by the house and I rang my mum up and said, Mum, I've, I've prayed that prayer and she's, crying her eyes out and she says oh I've got my my friends here he's a pastor and we were just having a meal and like he said he'd love to meet up with you and I'd met him once before when they came around to do some deliverance on me because I was you know full of demons um 
And so I knew him vaguely and I went to knock on his door and he lived around the corner, five minute walk. And I remember knocking on his door and he opened the door and he said, uh, come in champ, I've been expecting you. And I'm, I'm looking around, I'm saying, champ, who, who, I'm not a champion, look at me. I'm a nine stone crack cocaine addict full of schizophrenia, full of darkness, full of pain and shame and guilt. But he said, no, 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 God told me you were a champion. And he, and he, he still, if I speak to him today, he would still say, he'll, or email or whatever, because he lives in America now, he'll still say champ. And he said, I'm going to say it till you believe it. And he just kept on, on. Every time I went around there, they prayed for me. I fat, they drove me around to pay off debts. They took me in the car. They put themselves in the firing line of people that wanted to throw me in the back of a van because I had so much money. And my sisters did as well. They helped out as well. They they let they they didn't lend me money. They helped give me money that they didn't really have themselves just to get clean because they wanted. I needed a fresh start. And I started reading my Bible and I started praying and I had these dreams and these visions. I started having dreams about my dad when he died. And in the dream, he was saying to me, son, I did love you. I just didn't know how to tell you. And I'd wake up crying from that. And and I felt God was saying like your dad, you know, he, he helped me for, to forgive my dad. So it was like a journey of healing and restoration and all that. And I became zealous for this, you know, for this Jesus, not the religious side of it, but I'd go into the, I moved up north to Newcastle, Sundon area where a church was helping me. And I started to go out on the streets of the worst places in Newcastle to the homeless and taking them food, putting their dirty clothes in a bag, taking it back to my flat, washing them, taking them back the next day so they had some clean clothes, letting them come to the flat for a shower. And I started to just want to help as many addicts and as many hurting and broken people as I possibly could. My old mates started ringing me up. And things were happening fast. You know, I was preaching on events. I was getting asked to speak at all these churches because it was such a dramatic story, such a powerful transformation. I wrote a book about it, um, which I'd love people to read because not sort of, I don't get money from it because whatever money that does come in, I give it back away. So I've, and what's the book called? It's called, in, the first one is called Internal Revolution. I did call it Satan's Lost His Grip On Me which I liked the title of, and the pu the publisher said, no, I think the word Satan, and it might put some people off. So we changed the name. It's called Internal Revolution. It's on Amazon. You can get Kindle. You can get the hard copy sent to your door. Um, and I've then I've written another one called A Champion's Resolve, because for me it's like that whole thing of being a champion. Um, champions don't win every round, but they win They win eventually. You know, So you might lose a round. You might lose, you might lose a fight, but there's another one down the road. There's a rematch. There's another, you know, the bell hasn't rung for you yet. So it's kind of like that, about being a, you know, being a bit of a champion spirit, you know, like, come on, you can do this. Uh, and then the final book I wrote is not the final one, but the latest one I've written is called Coming Out Gold, which is about the porn addiction, the sex addiction, addiction in general, really. And some stuff I've learned and what I think the Bible says about that, what God says to you about that, even if you are a, a drug addict, scumbag, as people labor you, you're not to God. You're loved. He cares about you. He sent his son to die for you. So for me, it's not the religious side of it. It's not. It's about a God who really does love, who really is interested in our lives, who wants involvement as a father to a son or a father to a daughter, not to beat you up with the Bible, not to make you tick all the boxes of religion, but to really connect you back to the one who made you in the first place so that you don't keep striving and escaping, but you find the source of that love. And so, yeah, I'm a passionate Christian that's made a lot of mistakes as a Christian, as many, if not more, as a Christian as before, because it's like then you're in the firing line. The devil does not want people to believe in God. So you kind of come right under his, his radar then. And we started churches. Um, we've started charities. We've done so many things. My wife and I probably haven't had a Christmas in our one or two Christmases in the last 14 years we've been married that's not had a homeless guy or a ex-mate or drug addict friends sitting at the table because they just ring up and some of them have got free and some of them have killed themselves. So there's a mixed bag of emotions there, you know, to see that my life and my turnaround has helped a lot of people, but then I've also hurt people. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of a very raw emotion for me right now, knowing that the good I want to do is sometimes or has been undermined by that flaw in that character that still hasn't been healed, mm. you know? And that's hurt someone. And then that marks your reputation and you're like, you're trying to beat that reputation again. And it's, so there's been a real mixed bag, but it's like the whole time, no matter what I've thought about myself, no matter what people have said about me, when I open up the Bible and I see what God says about me, if I can believe that, it changes me forever. 
because he really does love me unconditionally. He really does think I'm the apple of his eye. Even if I'm depressed, even if I'm suicidal, even if I've just hurt somebody, it doesn't change his opinion on me, you know? Do you think, this is probably for someone so heavily religious, I'm going to ask it anyway. Go for it. Do you think there's a, do you think there's a possibility mm. that God, mm. the person that doesn't make you feel alone anymore yeah. and forgives you and accepts you, mm. do you think there's a possibility that God is actually the part of you that accepted yourself eventually? I've been asked similar questions to that, actually, quite a few times. Um, or some people have said, you think God's now your addiction? You know, you just replaced your addiction with religion. And No, I, I don't. I think that the studies that I've made from the scriptures, the historical acceptance from every other religion that Jesus was actually a factual historical figure, whereas a lot of them can be disproved or a lot of them can be made to, you know, their character is definitely in question. Um, Jesus has been proved time and time again. Historic, he's a, historically a factual figure. There's no denying it. What people try to disprove is that he rose from the dead. Because if he rose from the dead, then he's actually God. He's not, he's not just a, a good man or a good prophet. He's actually God. So I don't think it's a matter of um, some sort of humanistic thought about God. For me, I've, I've seen things that would shock Everybody or anybody, you know, I've, I've seen demons coming out of children. I've seen witchcraft at its worst. I've seen miracles, blind eyes open after prayer. And I've seen them not open as well, which also is a, is a concern. Like, and I'm like, so I get why people don't believe, oh, 100 people got healed, but my dad didn't. You know, that was always my thing, you know, with my mum. I was like, but my dad died. You know, you say about this God of love and mercy, and but my dad died. And the fact is we live in a world that's not just got a good God in it. It's also got a very rotten devil in it. And the world is corrupt and the world is flawed and the world is broken. And there's healed people and there's sick people and sickness is contagious. It often affects good people too, you know. And so for me, it's it's much more of an intimate relationship with God than it is a religious, legalistic, ritual kind of a thing. I don't go to church because I have to. Or I don't pray because I have to. I pray because I get to and I want to and I want to know more about this God who made me. So when I preach on the platform or if I share like this, it's never a, a legalistic thing about rules and ticking the boxes and because you gave your money to the church, you're 10% or because you, you prayed three times a day or, or, or whatever. It's not about that. I can just be driving my car and I'm having a chat with God. I'm on the train and I've got my eyes shut and I'm just saying, God, if you want to speak to me, speak to me. And last night I was in the bath and I just heard this voice, clear as anything, say to me, self-loathing. So self-loathing. So I got me f notes out on my phone mm. and I just felt God say to me, you'll only ever be as big as the opinion of yourself. You're limiting yourself, son, because of your self-loathing. You've got to stop. You've got to forgive yourself. And I'm just having a teary emotional moment last because I was feeling crap last night. So you feel like God's your your constant, permanent self-help manual? Yeah, 100%. He's a self-help because he wants to help. He, wa he wants to bring us into the full picture of who we were created to be before we messed up, before sin came into the world, Adam and Eve and all that story, you know, before brokenness existed, he wants us to live our best life. So, yeah, he's motivational. Yeah, he's self-help, but he's much more than that. He's supernatural and he's intimate and he's kind and he's good. And there's no one, devil worshippers, he he'll, he'll, he'll accepts them and he'll, he'll, he'll change them. He doesn't accept the, the stuff we're doing. He's, he's not angry with, with me anymore. He's angry with that thing that I might be doing that's distancing me from him, which is why he sent Jesus on the cross to become that advocate, to become that atonement for that sin because we couldn't do it ourselves. So Jesus effectively went into the courtroom, my eternal courtroom. You know, I've been in a lot of courtrooms. I'm sure you've probably been in a few. Um, and, the, and the judge and the jury decide guilty or not guilty and the gavel goes down and you get told what your, what your sentence is or what your, what your future is. And it's like I was guilty as hell, deserving of hell. And Jesus went in and said, okay, he's guilty, but put, put all that punishment on me. Let me take that. So for me, it's like this self-sacrificial, loving saviour came into my life 18 years ago. And even though I failed him many times on that last 18 years, that journey, and I'll still fail him for the next 18 or however long I've got, um, he doesn't give up on me. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So yeah, he's, in a t he's a constant, every time I feel like I can't go another day, He'll just, one one verse will come into my mind that I read a week before or just a memory of something good that he did for me. And, and it's like, it's like he won't let me give up. 
You know, he is the champion of champions. He's like the, he is the, the father at the sports day race when the sun falls down and everyone has overtaken him. And even if he comes last, he's still going to make out as if he's just won the race. You know, that dad that just, mm. you, you won, you crossed. Oh, everyone went before me, dad. No, nah, you're my winner. You were the best. You know, that's, that's what I see him as. He's a father that's good. And you know what? If a religion mm. can turn a man from a crack smoking, yeah, yeah, yeah. violent, Mm. self-loathing individual yeah. to someone like you that sat in front of me now full of love and joy that mm. wants to help and heal yeah. the world mm. and hasn't got an ounce of malice in them, yeah. then I respect you, your religion and, and the way you believe yeah. in it yeah, thanks. and the way I you mean, move with yeah, it. I appreciate that a lot. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't always believe. Like I, I, remember, I remember really passionately not believing in God because I was angry and I blamed God for the, you know, so if God was real, he wasn't good. Um, so I get it when people don't, I've, I've got mates that have called me all sorts of things, you know, and some have been respectful. Some have been very disrespectful, but I get both sides cause I've been there. So I totally get why people don't believe as well. Cause we look around and there's a lot of reasons to doubt. There's a lot of reasons to think, is there a real God who's loving and good? You know, I deal with things in Malawi and you know, sometimes I have to sit there and really take in and then God reminds me, son, the reason I've sent you here, the reason that. You're, you've got this passion to do this is because I hate what's happening to these kids and I'm asking you to help me because I've, he, ha, he has given us the responsibility to serve him. He could do it all in a flick of an eye, which is the argument. Why doesn't God just flick his fingers and everyone stops being rapists, murderers and haters? It just doesn't work like that because we've got free will. We've got free choice. And if we didn't have, we'd be a, a world full of robots and just iron men, tin men, you know, just doing what we're, you know, puppeteers. Um, but we're not, we've got free will to, to, you know, and love has to be like that to love somebody, to love God back has to be a free will offering. Otherwise it's not real. You know, you don't want your kids to love you because you, they have to, you want them to love you because they do love you, you know? And so, yeah, it's a hard one for a lot of people to reason in their mind. And I get it, especially guys from our background, um, which is why I don't preach it heavy. And my book, if people want to read my book, it's not heavy. It's not me. Pre I think it's the last two chapters that mention a bit about the gospel, the, 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 the opportunity to be saved from, from hell and sin. The rest of it's just my whole story, prison, drugs, and, and other bits that we haven't touched on today. And if there's anyone out there that wants to, wants to know more, I'm, I'm available. The fact that you use your religion for good, yeah. it, I, it gets nothing but my respect. Thanks. And I believe if, uh, if more people in the UK had your Christian values, the country would be, wow. a, be the <laughs> country would be a better place. Yeah. I strongly believe that. And I'm not a Christian. Yeah. And there's other people that I think use their religion yeah. uh, for bad. Yeah, 100%. And then that would be a very different conversation. Yeah. But I can see that your religion yeah. is important to you. You put it to good yeah. use. Uh, and you're a good man. So yeah. for me, uh, it's a it's a yes from me. Well done, mate. Thank you. And it means a lot. I just want to end it on what you're doing in Malawi now. So I had a vision. And that's East Africa. Yeah, southeast. Yeah, southeast. So, it's, it's landlocked. It's one of the smallest countries in Africa. It's a tiny little country compared to you know a lot of the countries there. Um, it was the third poorest in the world. I went up to tenth. Now it's back down to about six or seven, I think, with the new government. Um, very very corrupt country, like most sadly most countries are in Africa, um, where, where there's poverty, there's often corruption is very close by. Uh, I I was in a hotel in Manchester. I'd been to a conference. I was you know, speed up because people don't want to hear all of this. And there's, you know, there's other ways they can hear the full, fuller story if they want to. But I was just drifting off to sleep and I had this vision that just blew my, like literally as panoramic as I'm seeing you now, as, as detailed as I'm seeing you now. In this vision, I'm with Jesus and there's a dead child in a shallow, dirty river. The water was, I could tell by the surroundings in the vision that it was Africa. And me and Jesus were picking up this dead child and very, very compassionately, gently laying this child on the side of the of the river because obviously we didn't want to leave the body where it was. And it hit me so hard, it, it, my heart just I burst into tears. It was something so powerful. And I heard this voice very clearly, which I knew was God, say to me, will you go to Africa, invest money that you haven't got yet and help me rescue my children who are suffering? And that was almost word for word. We said money that you haven't got yet. Because at the time we had a decorating business that was doing reasonably well. We, we just started to go on holidays as a family. We'd never had any money during our marriage. We'd always just lived off donations because we were starting churches and charities. And, you know, we didn't take a wage. We still don't take a wage. 
Um, I, I refuse to take a wage from the charity, so I don't want people to think it's one of them charities that just the CEO or the director gets a massive salary and everyone else is still starving. So we live on family and other friends that just say, look, you know, we're going to support you 50 quid a month or whatever so that you can do this work that you feel called to do. And then we do a bit of pig farming where we are, the land that we've got, we do some farming on it just to try and bring in some income. I do a little bit of online gym coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching with some richer guys out in Malawi, just anything to pick up a little bit of money. My wife is a, a singer-songwriter. She does a little gig here and there and gets 50 quid or, you know, because they haven't got the money that these big, big pubs and venues have got. Little things like that that we do just to sustain ourselves. And the reason we went there is this vision. And then I, as I was telling you that, I, another vision came and it was like a coffee beans. I thought I was seeing tens of thousands of coffee beans. But it was because I was far away in this vision. But it kind of zoomed in. And as it zoomed in, I realised they're not coffee beans. They were the faces of dead African children. And again, I just broke down. I felt like they were my kids. It was that emotional connection that they, they felt like they were my kids that died. And God was saying to me, tens of thousands of my kids are dying in poverty and hunger every day around the world. And what are people doing about it? And I felt like he was calling me to action. And so I gave up the business. My wife agreed to follow me out there. We packed as much as we could. We gave away loads of our furniture, our beds, everything. We went out there not knowing where we were going to live. We got an Airbnb for a month and then a house became available um, with some land on it that another Christian couple, another English couple that had been there 30 years but felt like their time was was over and they, they wanted to support us being there. They've become our mentors. Um, they're the ones helping us right now just for a month to just rest while we deal with some of this PTSD and some of these other things that are going on after four and a half years of dealing with kids that are being raped and abused and we've had people dying on our doorstep, malaria all around us. Um, you know, horrific, horrific stuff. Dealing with the stress of the corrupt police that won't let you go past the blockade unless you give them a fiver and, you know, they just tie in your hands when you're going to court to fight for the justice of a young girl that's been raped by her granddad and her uncle for the last two years. And two years later, we still haven't got justice for this young girl called Eunice. So we've got her living in one of our compounds in a house with a widow that we've supported. We've asked her if we f if we give you the money each month, will you just take her on like a daughter? A young widow. She's like only in her mid-30s. Um, so she's taken her on. So we just educate and supply the food. We feed 60-something kids every morning from the village where we live. So we're literally smack in this really very poor suburb village where the, 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 the top wage would be like 50 quid a month for a bricklayer, six days a week working all the hours, you know, with the sun's up and he gets 50 quid at the end of it. And to feed his family costs him 100 quid a month. So he's always still striving and struggling. You know, it's never enough for them. So we we take clothes out to them on this trip. When we go back, we'll take a suitcase extra each full of clothes or toys for the kids that live amongst us. We built, we had some builders from Luton called BBK. They did a 10 grand fundraiser thing for us. They came out, five of them, and laid all the blocks and built us a little school. Um, on the bit of land we've got. So we educate these kids as well. And we're trying to expand. Obviously, I want to do that in other little villages around. I want it to be the first one that feeds, gives health care to these kids, educates them, gives them a good transformed mind from the cultural mindset of drinking blood and going into this witchcraft that is just literally on our doorstep. Um, and then we train farmers. I'm not a farmer, but we've partnered with another group that give them really high-end farming training so that they can produce much better crops each year on their own little pieces of land, which obviously gets them out of a little bit of poverty themselves. Um, so, yeah, we've been there four and a half years. We're going back at the end of the month. Might stay for another two or three weeks and you know, just to have a bit more rest because I think we could do with that. It's been a stressful time. Mm. And we go back and we'll just keep ploughing the ground, just doing as much as we can to love these kids and feed them. I'll tell you what, I yeah. will invite you on mm. for a part two in the hope you'll accept maybe a year from now mm. and have a whole conversation on what you're doing yeah, well, in Malawi. Well, that'd be a whole conversation yeah. about that. Yeah. Because... By this, I mean, I don't know how long we've been speaking for, but I've I've thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah, me too. Really interesting, massively connected with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel very, very up. Although the yeah. topics have been dark, yeah. I feel very much yeah. energised. Good. And how anybody can sit and watch this and not see that you are a real good man. Uh, 
Yeah, it's been a joy. Thanks, man. And I, I will invite you on for a part yeah, two. I'd love to. Because I think there's so much to unwrap there. Yeah. And I don't want it to detract, yeah, distract yeah. from yeah, yeah. your life story yeah, yeah. So and, and, and how you got to that moment. Because yeah. I think that I think that, that this next story mm. is going to be equally as powerful. Yeah, definitely. And it needs to be noticed what you're doing. Thanks, man. It, it needs to be really, yeah. really noticed as a, as a separate thing. So I'm sadly going to say until the next time. Yeah, but there will be a next time. There will be a yeah, next time. Good. I look forward to it. And this time has been a joy. And I want to thank you and really mean, thank you for trusting me with your story. No, I appreciate and, the way uh, you handled it. And, and sharing this time with me. No, God bless you. And you, yeah, brother. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Cheers, I'm telling bro. everyone they need to follow you because even though the content might be sort of hard hitting and adult content, a lot of it, it's, it's stuff that's going on in the world. People need to know that these people are out there hurting, crimes are being committed, people are out there and there's there's hope for everybody. So thanks for the content that you're putting out as well. That's my pleasure yeah. and it's my job. God bless you. Cheers, bro. Cheers, man.